All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Colton Ogden. This is CS50 on Twitch. And today, we're going to do a little bit of basic game programming. Uh, we had a bunch of people in the stream, uh, in the chat, prior to uh, the stream's beginning, a bunch of people um, chatting while we play a little bit of music, you know, while we wait for people to uh, come into the chat room here. So we have a bunch of people, some shout outs. So 09, uh, Jay Lardenois, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that, but um, proposed a something that was going on with Spotify. I guess if right now until December, if you uh, um, get Spotify Premium, you get a special IoT device, a Google Home Mini. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, we have Karal Say in the chat. We have JP Guy, a regular who I actually haven't seen for a couple of streams, I don't think. Um, but glad to have you with us again. We got Ann 100. We got Sashkant32, Dananj1438, Bella Cures, Asli, Nuanda3333. Um, forgive me if I'm missing anybody else, but we have a lot of people in the chat today. So uh, Tic-Tac-Toe is going to be the subject of today's game. And by the way, if anybody is curious about the music that we play before stream, it is, let me bring my laptop into focus here, uh, a channel called No Copyright Sounds. They have a very gracious license. You can, you can use their music for YouTube and Twitch. They have a bunch of great music. So we, we usually play a, a few songs just to start things off, just to let, you know, let folks trickle in 10 minutes prior to streams beginning. So that's the music we were playing today. So a bunch of no copyright sounds, YouTube channel music. Their house playlist is good. They have a, another playlist that I usually use. Um, for those unfamiliar with any of the prior streams that we've done, we, uh, we do 2D and 3D, or I do 2D and 3D game development tutorials here on stream, and I usually use for 2D stuff Lua and Love2D. So Lua is a programming language. Love2D is a framework that we use, which has a lot of nice, uh, super cool functions and utilities for making games. A couple of uh, things that I'd like to shout out as well today. Uh, well, one big thing is our friends at Expo. So shout out to Charlie Cheever at Expo, who did a seminar with us before on how to actually ship uh, mobile apps in Expo, which is a super awesome uh, platform. Uh, he and some of his uh, crew are developing a cool app called Castle, which actually lets you um, run other people's Love 2D games super easily just off of GitHub. So you don't actually have to download anything. You can download stuff. Um, so if you go to playcastle.io, they actually they, uh, they have a uh, distribution for Windows and Mac OS currently. And I downloaded it here just so we could demonstrate it. So you pull up Castle. It looks a little something like this. It's a very sexy interface. Um, you can actually see that they have kind of some featured games going on. And um, you can go to the Playing tab, which will be whatever current game you're playing right now. And at the bottom, there's a URL bar, which is cool. Because then you can go to, for example, our Snake stream that we did before. So in my GitHub repo, I have uh, github.com slash coltonoscopy slash snake50 which uh, was the repo that we created a couple of streams back, uh, I want to say two weeks ago-ish. Um, so we made Snake. And if you go to the main.lua in any GitHub repository that is a valid Love 2D game, which has a, a main.lua, which we'll look at, and you go to this raw button here, you click on that, you get this uh, raw.githubusercontent.com link. You can command C or control C that URL, go back to castle, go to the URL bar, hit enter into that, and it'll actually load the game in, excuse me, in uh, in Castle, so you don't have to download anything. Now it's a little bit, it's going to be a little bit cramped because I'm actually running my game in 720p, and uh, I believe the window size that I set for Snake was 720p, so it's a little bit, a uh, little bit cramped. But I can actually play this. This is the this is the e game that we uh, implemented last, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, right? And so they're they're basically wrapping. Um, Love 2D in, in this cool graphical environment where you can dynamically load other people's content. You can load your own files. You can use console debugging. They're going to integrate a, a, a text editor into it at some point, uh, is what Charlie told me. If you download it, play with it, and you want to give some feedback, um, if you go to bit.ly, bit slash ly, uh, bit.ly slash castle feedback. They're looking for as many suggestions as you can provide them because they want to make this a super awesome game development ecosystem. So definitely uh, check that out. Now let me catch up on the messages uh, in the chat here. So I know we have a few. Uh, and that was a little bit of a, a long set of, uh, of stuff. So Mage Drafat says, hi Colton. Hi everybody. Hi Mage. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Irene is in the chat today. Hello Colton everybody. Nice to see you all. The only thing higher than Colton's hair is my opinion of him. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, 
JP guy, I will assure you, I'll never say that again as long as you keep us giving us great wine and pasta. I know people are people are chatting about their uh, their countries of origin here in the chat. Uh, Bavik Knight, hello, good to see you. Bella Cures, hi, says hi. Gassen, good to see you. Hello, welcome. Um, yeah, no, you're not late, Bavik. We uh, we just started. We're just uh, just just was demoing a little uh, bit of Castle. So go to playcastle.io. I plugged it there in the chat. That'll be the actual link to download the Castle program, which you can then go to any GitHub repo that has a main.lua. Remember, you have to click the raw button though. It has to be that. Um, the way that Castle's programmed, it's looking for that particular URL, and then it'll fetch all of the other resources that are part of the uh, of that particular Love 2D game. And let me just make sure. Yeah, Castle is genius. Yes, it's great. Uh, it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a really cool program once uh, once it gets all the bells and whistles that Charlie has envisioned for it. But it's it's really cool. Um, and then playcastle.io is the actual URL to get the program. And then if you want to provide them some feedback, and they are very eagerly seeking like all feedback. Um, sorry, that was the wrong URL. Bit uh, castle feedback. That first URL could go anywhere. So I, the, I'm not going to speak on behalf of that URL. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, castle seems super cool, doesn't it? The um, definitely, if you check it out, definitely give them as much feedback as possible so they can make it the best platform, the best platform uh, that they can make it. Sasha count thirty two downloaded it already. Awesome. Well, thank you for supporting it. It's a cool, it's a cool initiative, and they uh, they have a lot of cool things envisioned for it. So, what are we going to look at today? Well, Tic Tac Toe uh, is a game that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, if you're not familiar with, I am using CS 50s own uh, CS 50 or draw .cs 50io which is the program that Dan Coffey and I looked at yesterday. So it's a drawing app that David uses in lecture. And we can use it in the web browser at any time. If you just go to draw.cs50.io, it'll use a local, uh, a, a local sort of scratch pad. So this isn't being broadcast anywhere. No one has access to it. This is only on your machine. And if you go to draw.cs50.io slash some URL, for example, if I were to create a URL called uh, tic-tac-toe, for example, this will be a, a URL that all of us can draw on at the same time. So why don't we do that? Just uh, We'll see if it hopefully doesn't devolve into too much. But uh, tic-tac-toe, if anybody is familiar, and actually I realized we could play tic-tac-toe this way too, or people could play tic-tac-toe amongst themselves. Um, but tic-tac-toe is a game where you have this grid, right? And two people play against each other, and the goal is to make a line in a particular direction. So it can be vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, and it has to be three of the same symbol in a row. So if I wanted to be, for example, uh, there's two different uh, shapes. Uh, that was a poorly drawn X. So you have two symbols that you can play. You can play either X or O. And so if I'm X and I, and I go here, it looks like somebody else drew an O. But the goal is to sort of match. Yeah, exactly. We play turn by turn. And so we first person to get a match sort of wins the game, right? And if you keep doing this indefinitely, uh, yeah, <laughs> somebody's trying to get a, uh, nice, yeah. That person took, that person cheated and they took two turns. But yeah, you basically take turns one at a time and whoever gets three circles or three X's in a row, uh, whoever won says I win. Um, I'm not sure who that was, uh, but whoever puts uh, three X's in a row or three circles in a row is the winner. And it can, like, again, it can be, in this case, it was a vertical match, so we got three O's down the center. Um, you can do a horizontal match and you can do a diagonal match. And there are only two diagonal matches possible, that being from the top right to the bottom left and from the top left to the bottom right. And so there are a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible kinds of matches. If you consider that you can get three vertical matches, three horizontal matches, and two diagonal types of matches. Um, I'm going to, just so that my browser doesn't lag too much, in case people continue to use it during the course of the stream, I'm going to go from that to just the regular draw.cs50.io. Um, and I don't think I'm going to need to use it for too much more. But that's the overall gist of tic-tac-toe, right? I guess we could, we could start drawing out a couple of the um, design considerations that we need. So the first thing that we're going to need, right, is, and we, we saw something similar to this in Snake, is we need a 2D grid, right, to represent our grid of X's and circles, right? And so there are multiple ways that you could implement this uh, in terms of the actual interface. You could make it circles that are sprites. So you draw an X, you draw a circle as a PNG file, 
save that, export that, and then draw that in the right position on the game board. Um, and the way that I did it when I started off in CS many years ago, 2010, 2009, um, for a CS course was we actually did it in, uh, at the command prompt in C++. And you could do the same thing. You could draw out your X's and circles, because all you need is just the, the character X and the character O. You could draw that in a 2D grid, a 2D array, as it's known in C++, um, a 2D table in Lua. You draw that out at the command prompt and take turns at the command prompt using um, you know, an input command like cin in C++, or scanf in C, or raw input, or input in Python. Um, so there's many different ways you could implement this. Today we're going to be doing it in Love2D, we're going to be doing it in Lua, and because we're doing it in a 2D game engine, we'll be using, uh, we'll be using sprites. And I think I'll just make my own sprites because it'll be super easy. Um, and we could theoretically just use graphic, we could just use shapes. So we could do something like two lines uh, representing an X, or just a circle, a line circle, to represent the O. But that would be, the, that would be either of those approaches are perfectly valid. Gaston says, much better than 3D Unity. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what you like. If you like 2D games, you know, obviously you're going to like love 2D and Lua a bit better. Um, if you like 3D games, you're going to like Unity better, probably. I, I'm not strictly partial to either, but um, I do enjoy Lua and love 2D very much. Bavix downloading, downloading DinJ. Uh, Carl say, says, I just figured out that Tic-Tac-Toe is actually tries. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Is that in another game? Uh, uh, by, is the same game by a different name, I guess? Yeah, Bavik Knights as they won. Yeah, with a circle, 2D array. Paro 10, always use Python, kids. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier, I tell you that. Debugging, even a simple game like uh, Tic-Tac-Toe and C++ can be, can be a little rough. For Sunlight says, I have class and will watch this later. Yeah, awesome, definitely do. Definitely, uh, definitely uh, toss a comment on YouTube if you catch it later. Carl say, so we're going to see some art, some, uh, some art, you know, with quotes, <laughs> not the greatest. Uh, I'll say, I, I should have my uh, sprite editor of choice installed on this account. Hopefully, if not, I'll have to use like Photoshop or something. Unity makes it easy to generate 3D meshes from 2D procedural generation, like if you wanted to make a procedural 2.5D RPG like Diablo 2. Yeah, it's not, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's easy, but it is, it is possible. It, it, mesh generation is... You can thankfully only have to really worry about it a couple times. And if you're doing simple stuff, like simple cubes, then yeah, it's not too, it's not too bad. You essentially just generate the six faces of the cube. Um, make sure you generate your vertices in the right order. Generate, put the triangles in the right order. But if you're doing something like dynamic, um, like doing like a, an actual dynamically generated dungeon, I would say it's probably easier to have prefabricated like arches and doors and walls and stuff, and then generate those rather than make the meshes procedurally. Procedural mesh generation can be messy, but no, it's it's definitely possible. Uh, always use MS Paint for sprites. Kappa says JP guy. Yeah, no, it's I, I would. I don't have MS Paint on here because I'm using a Mac, unfortunately. Uh, I love Pixel Edit as an editor. I didn't use Pixel Edit. I, I used Pixen a long time ago for Mac, which was kind of a nice uh, older but still pretty fleshed out uh, free Pixel Editor for Mac. Uh, I use a sprite these days. You can get it uh, for a fairly decent price, um, but it's not free. It's one of those things you'd have to get for, I think it's like 20 bucks or something. Uh, if, you're, if you're going full time into 2D sprite making, I would say it's probably worth it. But if not, uh, you can get by with GIMP, Photoshop, MS Paint, or Photoshop's not free. But you can get by with GIMP, which is free, and which is like Photoshop or many other different types of um, sprite editors. Let me see if I actually have a sprite installed on here. I'm not sure. It looks like I do. So this is a sprite. Let me see if it opens, which it does. So if I go to new file, um, I guess we can make these 32 by 32. So we'll do that, transparent background. And so now we have a little, this is our 32 by 32 pixel um, sprite here. And uh, I, this is even before we make any code. This is going to be awful, by the way. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, so let's just make it kind of like this red color, I guess. This will be the X. So we'll just something like that, something like that, something like that. Oh man, this is going to be just dreadful. It's not terrible, I guess, but I am not an artist. This is like the. It would be nice to be an artist, I will say. I, I would not mind being an artist. Um, but I am, I am not one by any stretch of the imagination. But there's our beautiful X. You like that? That's, I give the shout outs to that amazing artwork. Uh, I'm going to export as a PNG. 
I'm going to call, I'm going to go into dev. I actually haven't created the um, repo or the, the folder yet. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that first. So I'm going to go into, so mine is saved in my, um, uh, I usually keep all the, all the code in my dev, I have a dev folder in my uh, user folder. And I have a stream subfolder. I'm going to make a tic-tac-toe. And within tic-tac-toe, I'm going to make a graphics folder. And if I go back to a sprite, I wonder if that will have showed up. I'm not sure. Uh, yep, into graphics. And then in here, I'm just going to call this x.png. Save that. I'm going to go create a new file. Whoops, not open. I'm using the stylus, which is kind of nice. So this stylus is going to function not only as a draw.csv.io tool, but also a uh, nice little drawing tool, I guess. Uh, let's zoom in here a little bit. Everybody, don't make, don't make too much fun of my drawing skills. I know, it's, I know they're fantastic. Let's go ahead. Oh, that's the wrong tool. Let's go to the pencil. Let's make a circle. So just the worst circle you could ever possibly draw. Uh, let's make sure to close that. Close that. Again, not an artist. We just do what we have to do to make ends meet. And then save that, or export that, actually. And we're already back in that uh, prior folder we just saved in. So I'm going to go here to PNG. And I'm going to call this O dot PNG. Make sure I did that correctly. Amazing. So if I now I go back to Finder, I, now you can see I have a O.png and an X.png. So literally from the very beginning, uh, making the artwork that we need. Windows 10 has Paint 3D, says JP Guy. Bavik Knight says, and this paint is deprecated. Uh, yeah, and I know that people use Paint.net too a lot, which is kind of like the more feature rich version. Uh, no one as this is much better than I anticipated. It's good art. Uh, you guys are being you guys are being a little generous. I think distorting the truth maybe a little bit. Uh, any recommendations on good affordable stylus and pads? Oof, I don't know. Uh, I use Wacom, so this is a Wacom bamboo. Uh, I'm not sure. So Wacom tablets, and see maybe what some of the um, the more cheap ones are. Oh, we probably should have gone to the other link there. Um, I haven't been in the market for them for a long time. This, this one's old, really old. This one's like seven years old. Um, cheap or uh, best Wacom tablet cheap. Let's see if that works. See if that's a good. Uh, so you can get some for like 79. I would, say, I would say go for Wacom and get something probably within the 50 to 100. Excuse me, fifty to hundred dollar range is probably appropriate. You can obviously spend much more money than that for much more intense. Um, tablets, but that's not. Uh, it's, I certainly couldn't make use of it. So maybe as a professional uh, drawing, an artist, professional artist, it would make sense. But not definitely not for me. That is not who I am. Uh, let's make the circle a different color. Says Ashley. Sure, sure. Why not? Let's do that. Let's go back to the spread editor. Let's go. Let's make it. Uh, let's make it this nice blue color. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Bada bing, bada boom. Export and O dot PNG. And I think I can actually just do that, and it will export it correctly. It won't. Uh, I don't need to actually specify the file type. So now the X and the O are two different colors. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Strange, on my computer, it's in the accessories folder in the start menu. If everyone's trying to find the uh, Microsoft Paint. Wacom Intuos, says Carl Say. Um, so I'm trusting that's probably a good, nice entry-level tablet. Thank you. That's a pretty good price, says uh, Jardinois. Uh, J. Lardinois. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, and Bavik has uh, is an Im image post there in the chat. Let me see if see what that's all about. I don't think I can. I guess I could pull it up on the uh, stream there, but oh, it's a picture of his uh, thing on um, Paint 3D is what he's saying. Okay, makes sense. Yay! Thanks. Yep, that's right. Says J. Lardinois. Cool. So we've done no coding yet, but this is, you know, we have to set up our assets. So we have our X, so we have our circle. So I'm going to open up my tic-tac-toe project by dragging the folder into VS Code, which is the text editor that I used. We used it last time. And uh, in my project, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it main.lua. Remember, for Love2D, anything that you make, any project that you make, needs to have a main.lua as the entry point for the application, much like the main function in C. 
um, or other sort of comparable programming languages. I'm going to create a block comment that says tic-tac-toe. It's got my name and my email. And we've been through this before, but these are the boilerplate functions that you sort of have to create in order to uh, in order for to establish the sort of main game loop and initialization of your Love 2D project. So I have love.load, love.update, love.draw. Remember, load does stuff at the very beginning of the game before everything else runs. Love.update happens every frame. It's like a, it allows you to multiply operations and transformations by dt, which is your per frame delta, remember? And then love.draw is just what do I want to render every frame? And update occurs before draw. Um, and then that's the sort of basic flow of our application. If I hit Command L in VS Code to test running the application, we can see I do get a black window that opens up. So everything is working correctly there. Um, now, I have my, um, we, we, we created our sprites, our uh, sprite meaning just a 2D graphic that you can move around on the screen typically. We created an X and a circle, and they were 32 by 32 pixels. So they're going to be fairly small when we actually run our game. Um, so I thought something that would be fun to do today would be to actually use a library that I'm a big fan of called Push, which will allow us, excuse me, Push. I have my voice cracked there a little bit, it sounds like. Push, which is a, uh, a library that lets us pretend like we're rendering to a smaller resolution, but it will fill the window so that we get this retro look and the pixels are a lot larger, but it's still you know 1080p or 720p, whatever. Uh, Carl says, would you mind to show which extensions do you use for Lua programming? Um, so the extensions that I use for in Visual Studio or VS Code for that is just this one called Love 2D Support by Pixel Byte Studios. Um, the main thing that I like about that is that you can do on a Mac Command L from within Visual Studio Code, VS Code, and it will just bring up the application. You don't have to go into your command prompt and type Love, you know, whatever your alias is for Love, which they ins they instruct you to do in Love2D.org um, to set up, or on Windows, you know, clicking and dragging your folder onto the actual um, shortcut or program can get kind of tedious. And for those unfamiliar, if you want to download Love2D, lo Love the framework, go to Love2D.org, and on the wiki they have a bunch of instructions as to how to actually set up your um, your operating system to use it and use it the most efficient way. So uh, on the getting started page, for example, you can see they go through you know, different IDEs you can use and how to alias the actual path to love so that on the, in the command prompt you can type love space dot. And so they have all the instructions for Mac OS X, Linux, and Windows there. So definitely check that out. Configure your system the way that you want. And then uh, if you download, if you are a VS Code user and you download the Pixel Byte Studios Love 2D support extension, you can just Command L or Alt L if you're on Windows. Alt L or Command L, assuming that you set up the path appropriately, um, and it will pull up the window for you and just kind of save you some time. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and download the push library. So if I do love 2D push library, we should get a GitHub URL for it. Yep, this one, that's yulidev slash push. So Yuli Dev is a is a, a pretty prolific love. Uh, he's in the love forums all the time, and he made this library super cool. You can see they show you a little picture of you know sort of what it's trying to do. So you can see that it's per, like pixel perfect, changing that high word that that text, um, which is being rotated right. But you can see it's not like a very smooth rotation like you would get if you were rendering at a native resolution. It's actually like pixel by pixel, whatever the size of that box is, which looks like something like 50 pixel or maybe a little bit more than that, but 50-ish pixels by 50-ish pixels, right? And so what push does is it constrains your resolution to that size but lets you scale it out. So you get this nice crisp retro look, and this is what we use in the course, the games course that I teach or I taught earlier this year, rather. Um, I'm not going to clone it. I'm just going to download the zip, and I'm going to go, I'm going to unzip that. I'm going to just copy the push.lua file. So all I need is that push.lua. I don't need anything else. Um, and then I'm going to, in my tic-tac-toe folder, I have a, I'm going to make a lib folder because I'm going to use this as a library, and I want to sort of distinguish what my library is, libraries are from my actual source code. I'm just going to paste the push.lua into there. If I go back to my project and I say push equals require uh, lib slash push, remember you don't need to specify .lua when you include a Lua file. 
I can now say uh, virtual width equals, and I'm partial to kind of like Game Boy Advance resolution, which I believe is 240 by 160. So I can say I want my game to look like it's 240 by 160. Um, I could probably make it a square resolution. I probably don't need to make it. This is a widescreen resolution. So this is something like 16 by 9. So this would be if I was developing for modern monitors and I wanted to say, oh, uh, you know, make this retro looking, but still make it a modern uh, aspect ratio so that people on 1080p monitor can watch it and have it look nice. Um, but we're just making a tic-tac-toe game. So it doesn't really matter. I could make that like 240 by 240 or 160 by 160. I'm going to stick with 240 by 160, I think, just because I like the aesthetic. Um, and then in order for to actually make this work, in order to, you know, first of all, before we do any of that, let's just do something very simple. Let's just say love.graphics.print hello world, just so we can verify, and I, I'm partial to single quotes more than I am to double quotes. Remember, you can use both of them. Um, let's just make sure that's working. So if you look at that, you can see at the very top left, very small, I have hello world being rendered. But it's not, it's not in, a, in a small resolution, and we're still, we still have a square aspect ratio, right? I'm going to quit that. Uh, let's make sure I'm keeping up with the chat here. Um, ba -ba -ba. Would you mind to share? Okay, if you're using Windows and want to add an alias, be sure to use PowerShell and not Command. Says El Jardinois. Yes, that's correct. Um, and I would say on Windows, I would I'd be more partial to the VS Code approach to doing it, just because PowerShell is a little bit more complicated. If you can get VS Code, get that extension, and then link the extension in the settings, it's probably easier than PowerShell. Um, but if not, PowerShell could probably work. They have instructions for it. Bavik Knight says, I use Windows. I use uh, WSL more than PowerShell or Command. I'm actually not sure what Windows, what WSL is. Uh, oh, Winix subsystem for Linux. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, cool. All right. So we have our Hello World text rendering to the screen, which is great. Now I want to take our current resolution, which is mirroring the resolution of my screen itself. So whatever this is, it's pixel by pixel the same as my monitor. I want it to zoom in. I want to have that pixelated look. So I have, to use, I have to actually initialize push. So remember, I created this push variable up here. And I actually should make that local push equals require uh, lib slash push so it's not accessible. I mean, it, we could make it accessible anywhere throughout other modules. It's typically better practice to use local unless you intentionally want it to be a global throughout your whole project. Push, set up screen. And then what I need to do also is I want a window width, let's say 720p. So uh, window width would be 1280. And then window height would be 720. So this is the physical. Uh, actual window that I want on my screen. I'm going to say 1280 by 720, push setup screen, and then it takes in all of those as uh, arguments. So virtual width, uh, virtual height, window width, and then window height. And then it takes in a table after that where you can specify a few other things. So you can say full screen is equal to false. Uh, we can say uh, vsync is equal to true, which will just prevent a little bit of screen tearing. And then we could also say resizable equals true if we wanted to, which means that we could actually dynamically resize the window and have it work. Excuse me. So we've set up our screen. So we have this push sort of rendering to, the, to this other virtual window kind of that it's going to upscale to our, our actual physical window. In order to see this in, implemented, because if I do this, it's not going to do anything, right? Now we have this, this big, um, we have our actual uh, window set up to the right size, but push isn't triggering. So we're not getting that zoomed in look. So what I need to do is I need to say push start and push finish. So whatever happens after push start will get rendered to this virtual resolution, this uh, you know, Game Boy Advanced level resolution. And then that'll get pushed to the put to the window, and the window will render it like the window is kind of zoomed in, right? Like a pixelated retro look. And then everything uh, everything before finish will render that way. And then as soon as finish executes, it finishes, then it's done rendering to this virtual canvas, and it will start rendering back to the actual window at our at our normal resolution of our screen, right? So if I run this, notice that now we get this super pixel or super zoomed in. Uh, hello world. So now we're actually seeing a uh, the, the equivalent resolution of a Game Boy Advance. Um, there's a problem with it though, and the problem is that it's currently very blurry, and that's because it applies filtering to this canvas or to to the to the objects that it's rendering, and we can tweak that as well. Um, hit or miss? I guess they never miss, huh? The duck though. <laughs> that's weird. My windows always spawn in the middle of the screen. Uh, as they says, whoa, cool. All right, uh, let's fix the, the blurriness. So we can do that by love.graphics.set a default filter. 
So this default filter will apply to any resources, font objects, graphics objects, whatever we draw to the screen. And uh, filtering just means basically interpolating the pixels to smooth them out a little bit. But this doesn't work super well when we're trying to program things that are uh, a retro sort of 2D look because then it looks blurry um, because it's really zoomed in. What we want to do is uh, just put the pixels onto the screen as they are and not apply any filtering to them. Um, or at least the filter that we will be using will sort of sample the pixels directly and not blend them together. And uh, that, uh, that filter is called nearest, nearest neighbor filtering, which means take the pixel of whatever, uh, basically if we're looking at an image and trying to map it to our screen, whatever the closest actual pixel color is to that if we were to sort of multiply them together. Um, or divide, rather. And so if I go back to here uh, and I render it, now we can see that it actually is pixelated and it looks the way that it should. So now we have a virtual resolution that's similar to a Game Boy. And we can draw to it and we get this sort of nice uh, aesthetic, this retro aesthetic for free. The next thing that I think I want to do is actually draw those sprites that we created earlier just to see what those look like, right? And they should look more or less the same as they did in the text editor. So what I can do is I can say uh, local x sprite equals love.graphics.new image graphics slash and then um, what is this? Local x sprite, it, it would be at x.png and then local uh, o sprite would be love.graphics.new image graphics slash o.png. So this is just creating a new image object which we can draw to the screen. If I go and they're, they're being stored into variables called x sprite and o sprite, so those are actual sprite data, I can get rid of this hello world and then just say love.graphics.draw and then I'll just say x sprite for now just to test it out. And then just as uh, expected it draws it right there literally as we drew it uh, super pixelated and it's nice and zoomed in because we're rendering it at effectively 240 pixels wide by 160 pixels tall. So now we have this nice sort of retro look to our game. Uh, I'm going to implement a function called uh, love.keypressed which we've looked at before and all this does is it takes in a key and this will get called automatically every time we press a key on our keyboard. So I'm going to say if key is equal to escape then uh, love.event.quit. And so that way I can easily quit my application with escape and not have to manually go to command Q or click the red X or any, anything like that. Um, is it not a problem that the virtual res is 3 by 2 and you're upscaling to 16 by 9? Oh, am I actually not using a, a 16 by 9 resolution? Oh, I think that's correct, actually, yes. Uh, list of 16 by 9 resolutions. I use this fairly often. I forgot that the Game Boy Advance isn't actually 16, uh, true 16 by 9. You're, you're correct. You'll notice that there's actually letterboxing there, which I had thought was because I was just uh, rendering at 720p and it was trying to zoom it in. Uh, if we wanted to render at a proper 16 by 9 resolution, then yes, we'd need something like 256 by 144, which is a good one. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say 256 by 144, render that. And then now it's actually fitting the, the screen uh, at the exact uh, you know, boundaries that it should be. So thanks for pointing that out. Uh, who's pointing that out? Who said that? That was Karalse. Thank you. And then DJM's in the chat. Everybody shout out to David uh, for David J. Mellon for being with us. Glad everyone's joined us here today, he says. Awesome. So we have our virtual resolution. So now our game looks like it's from a bygone 2D era, a nostalgia filled era. And uh, we have our sprites that we implemented uh, from scratch ourselves in a sprite or whatever program, MS Paint, Paint.net, Photoshop, GIMP. The Master Jedi himself, says uh, El Jardinois. Yes, indeed. Um, so now we have to actually think about the logic for our game. So I'm going to switch back over to draw.csfd.io, draw which we were looking at before. And we can see uh, the first thing that we should take into consideration probably is this grid, right? So we have our, uh, basically, uh, whenever you play this game with your friends or whomever, there, there is a visual representation of the grid, so you at least know sort of where you should put your symbols, um, just to keep things kind of structured. So I think the first step that we should think about is just drawing some grid to the screen, just to represent the empty spaces where we can put our x's and and, uh, and circles, right? Um, so if I go over here, I know before that typically when we have grids, right, and we looked at this when we did snake and even concentration, typically 
what you do is you use a 2D array. You can use a one-dimensional array as well, but a 2D array lets us sort of visualize you know, what we want to look at. And we could actually manually, since we're only dealing with 3 by 3, we could, we could, uh, heart, we could sort of set up our grid ourselves and not even necessarily uh, do it in a loop like we did before with the snake grid, for example. I could say, um, let me put these, uh, those are fine actually where they are. We got the libraries, we have our, our constants, and then again, capitalized, word, or capitalized variables typically are, are constants. That's why we capitalize and underscore them. And then these are going to be our assets. So below our assets, I'll start implementing sort of our data structures. So data structures, and then assets, and then constants, and then libraries. Whoops. And before, what we did was we actually split this up into different files. And that's typically what I would do. I would say put libraries and assets in their own files, put constants in their own files. But this is going to be a fairly small game. We don't have to worry too much about that kind of engineering overhead. Um, and actually, there doesn't need to be a space there or there or there. Um, and actually, I'm going to set this up in advance on GitHub as well, just so that we can push to it and commit to it and whatnot on the fly. So I'm going to create a new repository. I'm going to call this uh, tic-tac-toe50. Uh, and then live stream implementation of tic-tac-toe in love and Lua. I'm going to make this a public repository so anybody has access to it. I'm going to create it on GitHub. I'm going to wait for that to finish, get this URL here, which I can then uh, establish as my remote. Uh, I'm going to go to make sure I'm in the right place. I'm going to slash dev uh, slash streams slash tic-tac-toe. And if you're unfamiliar, we did a stream, Kareem and I, on the basics of Git and GitHub. If you're, if you're not sure what's going on here, and actually on Friday we have another Linux tutorial, command tutorial, which will go into some of the details of maybe some of the commands that I'm using, like CD and LS and whatnot. Um, speaking of LS, let's make sure we're in the right spot. I'm going to git init, which creates an empty repository. I'm going to, this is bad practice, but I'm going to add everything with git add dot. I'm going to commit everything. Uh, I'm going to say first commit. I'm going to, notice that it created, uh, it has a reference to even my DS store, which isn't good, which isn't what I want. Um, and then I have graphics on my lib and my main.lua. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and remote add origin. I'm going to basically tell GitHub, or tell my repo that it needs to push to origin, or push to, uh, Whenever I, um, whenever I push to origin, it should reference this URL, this tic-tac-toe50.git URL. And then I'm going to uh, do that. I'm going to push origin master, which will push the master branch on that, uh, that endpoint. And so now if I go back here and I refresh, we'll see that everything that we just looked at is indeed at that repository. So if you want to follow along, you can go to, let me go ahead and make sure. I type this into here, so github.com slash coltonoscopy slash tic-tac-toe50. And you can follow along. I'll, I'll commit to it periodically. Um, hopefully I remember. If, if not, then I'll commit at the end at the very least. But we have a starter bit of code that everybody can experiment with. And I think if we just go, if I go to the main.lua and I go to this raw thing, which we looked at earlier, remember, for castle, and um, I'm just going to open up Castle and go to, let me just uh, wait for it to load. I'm going to go to playing. I'm going to type in the URL here, enter. If everything works correctly, indeed, in Castle now, I put in the GitHub URL. We can see my X, which we looked at, we tested ourselves, um, working in Castle. So you don't even need to download and mess with the code or anything like that to get it working. If you have Castle, it's just as easy as copying a URL. So again, shout out to uh, Charlie Cheever and his, and his uh, team working on Castle. So again, playcastle.io. All right, uh, let me just go ahead and clear out some of these tabs. And let's go back to the code. So again, the, the, what we were talking about before is we wanted to establish our grid, our 2D grid, um, where we can put our x's and circles. And it'll start off empty by default, right? So let's go ahead, go to our code. Um, and let's make the grid. So I'm going to say, I'm going to just call it grid. I'm going to make a table. And let's just make um, empty string, empty string, empty string. Copy that. 
and do that. That, that can maybe be our grid, right? So we have our three rows and three columns each. So super straightforward. We can use, um, we can do multiple different things. We could have the, we can have a string representation of the different indices. We can have empty string, meaning it's empty. We can have the string capital X, meaning that there's an X there, and the string capital O to mean that there's an O there. We can use integers. It's kind of however you want to think about it. Um, we're just going to use strings in this case because it's a little more human readable. I can see what's going on. And then if I go to uh, my draw function here, I'm just going to write draw grid as a function, which I haven't defined yet. I'm calling a function I haven't defined. And at the bottom of my application, I'm going to say function draw grid. And I'm going to say for y gets 1, um, 2, 3, do. And then for x is 1 to 3, do. And 3 is a magic number in this case. So I can say grid uh, height and grid width and put those up here with my constants. So I can say grid height equals 3 and grid, or better yet, I can say grid height, grid width equals 3, 3, right? So now I've got my, I've parameterized, effectively parameterized my grid as to what, like what it could represent. Typically, it'll only be 3 by 3. But um, in a theoretical world, I guess we could implement a game of tic-tac-toe that's 5 by 5. We're not going to dive into that today, but that's something you could definitely check out. And the same it would have the same kind of logic to it. Um, and you could, you could um, abstract out what it means to calculate the game such that it works, which we probably will do. Um, but I'm going to say for, for basically double nested loop for y gets 1 to the grid height, so for every set of, uh, of rows, um, and then iterating through those rows one at a time on the x-axis, I'm going to love.graphics.draw. So this is sort of where we would want to say if um, grid yx is equal to emptiness, then probably not draw anything, right? Um, uh, then, and then I'll just draw nothing. Else if grid yx is equal to uh, the string capital X, then we're going to basically want to draw the x sprite at its location, uh, at x times y location. And then else, I'm going to draw, uh, draw the circle sprite at x, y location. And then I'm going to call end. We're going to write the end keyword. And so this will be a love.graphics.draw function. Make sure I don't miss anything in the chat. Uh, bah, bah, bah. It's on my keyboard. It says Astley, c TV. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Uh, okay. So we're not going to draw. I'm not going to worry too much about if it's an empty string for right now. Um, another part of the grid, though, will be we need to draw the lines of the grid first. So draw lines of the grid, and then draw the sprites within the lines. So just let's say. Um, for, let's see, we need 2 and 2. So I can, I can almost just hard code this. So love.graphics.line. And then I'll say, um, we'll say 10. No, let's see, what would it be? We're going to kind of, let's see if we make it, if we would divide the screen by, uh, this is the screen here. And I'm going to want to draw this kind of in the middle, I'm assuming, with maybe a little bit of padding. So, Say this, and these are 32 each. This is going to be 32 with a little bit of padding. So let's say each of these maybe is 40 pixels. So each of these blocks should be about 40 pixels, 40 pixels big. So 40 times 3 is 120, and you know 120. Our resolution is two. Was it 256 by 144? I think. So we'll have about 24 extra pixels of padding on the top and bottom. Um, let me make sure that that's correct. Is that the resolution that we drew at? 256, 144? Yeah. So effectively, we can say, because um, we're going to effectively need uh, 144 minus 120 will be sort of this amount plus, th uh, sorry, uh, this amount plus this amount. And then the uh, 256 minus 120 will be, which is 136. So that'll be whatever this plus this is, right? So which we divide by 2 
to get, because we have to put the margin on both sides, right? Um, so we're going to divide that by 2, which we'll get um, 136 divided by 2 is 68. So I have 68 pixels on the left and right. And then we'll have uh, 20, so we'll have 12 pixels on the top and bottom. So 68 pixels here and here, and then 12 pixels on the top and bottom. So that's kind of how we figure out, you know, what m amount of margin we want to have for the uh, for the sides. So I can say we can calculate this. We can say uh, calculate margins. So you can say four. Um, no, not four. We can say the uh, local x margin is going to be equal to, um, uh, oh, we want to say probably we'll have a constant. We'll say the constant is going to be grid tile size. It's going to be equal to 40 pixels. We want to have 40 pixels of space for each place that we put a sprite. So we'll say that. And that will be the same on the x and the y. Uh, so that will give us effectively 8 pixels of padding on the x and y, which is four pic if we center it perfectly, 4 pixels of padding uh, on the, uh, the top, bottom, left, and right. Major Trafat says, Maths 101. Uh, Coral say says, this time we don't need the update function. We don't need it yet, but we will, because as soon as we want to start waiting for somebody to actually click on a grid tile, we will want to check for that every frame. And once they do click on a tile, then we can place the next, whoever's turn it is, whether it's X's or circle's turn, we can place the correct sprite. So we will need to test for that. Um, local X margin is going to be equal to, excuse me. Um, tile or grid tile size times three, right? That will be the 100 or times grid size. If we wanted to be uh, uh, grid width, if we wanted to be actually to actually use best practices here, we're using variable names. We'll say grid tile size times the grid width. Um, and remember, this is the amount of the uh, this is the amount that the grid will take up on the x axis, and we'll subtract that from the um, from the virtual width, right? So we'll do that, and then we can get the same thing for the y margin. So we'll say virtual height minus the grid tile size times grid height. And so that'll be the amount of margin like all together, including the left and the right side. We're only interested, if we're going to start drawing from the left and drawing from the top, we're only interested in half of that. And by drawing offset by half of that, we'll effectively have drawn the grid completely in the center. Z Gibbon says, hi there. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and figure out where we need to start drawing. So we, can, we don't need to draw the first line because tic-tac-toe just draws the two lines in the middle and then the two lines uh, vertically and horizontally. The two lines that are horizontally offset and vertically offset, but not the first, not the first uh, like where the, where the beginning of the grid actually takes place. It's only the inner lines that we care about. Um, so I can say love.graphics.line at the x will be the first x will be at uh, x margin divided by 2 and uh, y margin divided by 2 plus grid width and then this will also be plus grid height and so what that'll do is it'll draw it'll skip instead of drawing so if we were looking at this we don't want it to start drawing we don't want it to start drawing here, which is where it would. It's not working, which is, uh, for some reason, it's not drawing. Oh, uh, I think I might be in the, I might be in the dead zone he over here. Okay, so we don't want to start drawing here. We want to start drawing here, right? We want to start drawing this line and then this line and then this line and then this line, right? So instead of starting here, I'm going to say this is where this is where the grid starts or it's offset, but with with our our um, Margin divided by two on both of the uh, the x and the y, and then I can say uh, to start drawing the the this, if I want to start drawing this first line, I'll say this offset plus grid width, and actually that and because of that I don't actually need the the, the plus um, grid height here, um, and then I need the 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 love dot graphics dot line function takes in the x and the y where it starts, and then the x and the y that it um, where, where it ends, so the, the end point of that line. In this case, it's going to be at um, virtual width minus the x margin divided by 2 and y margin divided by 2. Uh, 
is that correct? No, I'm drawing, sorry. This is going to be the virtual height, uh, x margin divided by 2 plus the grid width. Because we're drawing the first line that's going down on the left. And then I can say uh, virtual height minus the y margin divided by 2. So let's test that that is actually working. So I'm going to run this. And as expected, it is indeed rendering the line sort of at the correct spot. So that'll be our, our grid line. Um, in the chat, we have Z Gibbons is that is the free course available on the web with Mayron. Uh, the free course available on the web. So this is uh, this isn't CS50, uh, the course taught at Harvard. This is an extension of CS50 where we take a lot of concepts that we don't necessarily have time to talk about in class, um, using a bunch of the core teaching staff and go into a bunch of miscellaneous topics. I specialize in game development. We've had people like Brian Yu, who is our head course uh, head teaching assistant, head teaching fellow. Um, uh, talking about React, and then yesterday Dan Coffey on the production team talked about the drawing app that I'm using here, which CS50 uses, for uh, which David draws on in lecture. So uh, we, we go over a whole bunch of topics, but you can sort of take this as a supplement to CS50. Crawl says, I made the game some day ago, and I didn't use the update function. I only used love.keypressed. Yeah, no, you, you could do that. Um, you could use love.keypressed. We're using, um, in this case, we're not using just keyboard input. We're going to use mouse input. You could use mouse pressed as well, and that, that would, I think that would probably work. Um, there isn't, yeah, because there's not strictly a timer needed for this. Jordan Wall says, I guess you could just use key pressed if you had the players just push the good positions on the numpad. Yeah, that's correct. You could do it that way, for, for sure. Um, we're going to be using the mouse, and um, I guess we could do it with the, with the keyboard, but we'll, we'll probably use the mouse. And um, in that case, we would only need love.mouse pressed because that's kind of the same idea. Uh, we'll, take, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it when that time comes. But yeah, good suggestion. Um, so we have the first grid line. Remember, we're, taking the, we're shifting over by the, our margin divided by 2 plus the grid size. And then remember, the top margin, the y margin is a lot smaller than the x margin. So that's why there's just a tiny bit of space up here. And then we're going to add the next line um, over here. And then we're going to add the horizontal lines. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Although it does look a little bit small. So I'm hopefully, hopefully, oh, sorry. I, did, I, used, I used the wrong variable. This should be grid tile size. I, was noticed, I, I did uh, notice that it was a little bit small, a little bit uh, not shifted over as much as it should be. Now that's more what it should look like. Um, so grid tile size, not grid. The grid width, the grid height, those are the, the, the number of grid segments in our actual grid. Um, so this is our first line. So I can say then uh, love.graphics.line uh, x margin divided by 2, or I can say actually virtual width minus x margin divided by 2 minus grid tile size y margin divided by 2. Uh, and then the same thing here. And then uh, this as well. So we're shifting it. We're, we're using the reference point from the right side of the screen at that point. Um, we could have just said plus grid tile size times 2, um, and that would have worked as well. But if I run this, now we have indeed two lines that are 40 pixels apart, roughly. Oh, exactly. And uh, that, that'll be on our, our, those are our two Y sort of our vertical lines. And then we can do the, uh, let's say, vertical lines and then horizontal lines. For this, we're going to do much the same. So love.graphics.line. And then we're going to say uh, x margin divided by 2. We're just shifting over by the x margin divided by 2, because these start at the very left edge of the actual grid. And then I'm going to say uh, y margin divided by 2 plus the grid size. So that's going to be um, plus grid tile size. Kind of the, the inverse of what we saw up here. Notice that this is x margin divided by 2 plus grid tile size, where, and then y margin divided by 2. In this case, it's x margin divided by 2, and then the y margin divided by 2 plus the grid tile size. So kind of the opposite. In that case, um, and then I can say uh, x 
uh, let's see, what's that going to be written out as? It's going to be the same. Uh, no, it's going to be actually the virtual width minus the x margin divided by 2. And then the virtual, uh, and let's see, that's going to be all going over. So it's actually going to be the same y. So it's actually, this is going to be the exact same. Let's go ahead and paste that. Let's run that, make sure that's working. Looks like it is, which is fantastic. I'm going to kind of do the same thing. Let's say lovetographics.line. Um, and then I'm going to say this is going to be the same on the x. So x margin divided by 2. This is going to be y margin. So this is going to be virtual height um, minus the uh, y margin divided by 2 minus the uh, grid tile size. And then the ba, 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 x margin. Uh, am I doing this correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And then the um, virtual width minus x margin divided by 2. And then take the same y again, because we're drawing the horizontal line. We don't care about changing the y. And then if I run that, we now indeed have a 3 by 3 grid. Awesome. Uh, Carl says, I actually made the worst way possible using arrow keys. I don't know. If that, I don't think that's the worst way possible. I think that's a perfectly valid way to do it. Um, I mean, that's kind of like programming for like a console or, or, you know, if we actually were programming for like a Game Boy or something like that's all you have. All you have is the keys, right? So you have to sort of figure out how to take your game design and make it appropriately usable for a handheld console. All right, so we have our, our grid lines. There's a little bit of what looks like transparency. So I'm going to say love.graphics.setcolor, one, 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 one. Um, I think it might just be because the, the line is so thin. So if I just say, um, in this case, love.graphics. Um, uh, set, what's the, oh, it's line width. And then I say two. This should work. That should fix it. So because the line width was one pixel, but we were so zoomed in, uh, the way that it renders single line, uh, single pixel lines is kind of semi-transparent. So we fixed that by making it a size two, and now the, the, uh, the grid is very vibrant and visible instead of like semi-transparent. Cool. Oh, and uh, one thing we did forget to do, which is you know not terribly important, um, but might as well do it. Tic-tac-toe 50. Or we can make this one word. And now our window at the very top has the tic-tac-toe 50. If the line width, uh, does it straddle the pixel if odd or start from the left edge of the line? If it, does it straddle the pixel if odd or start from the left edge of the line? Um, can you elaborate? Do you mean um, does, it, uh, does it bevel the line? Is that what you're talking about? So if I made, um, I think it just means the number of pixels thick that it is. The transparent size, there was a cute optical illusion where the line intersections disappeared when you weren't looking straight at them. Oh, is that, is that the case? Yeah, I know that there's a lot of that kind of uh, funny, those funny YouTube or Facebook sort of uh, optical illusion stuff. So if the x value is 10, does it draw the pixel from 11 and onward plus the width? Um, I believe if the x value is 10, it just starts drawing it at 10, right? If it's at the, um, if you're talking about the line width, It'll just end up growing the, growing the line itself out, depending on whether you're drawing it vertically or horizontally or diagonally. Um, it'll start drawing it at 10. Um, but the, the Y, I think, is where it'll actually end up. If, if you're moving it vertically, then, the, then it'll draw, I think it'll draw the pixel to the left of it and to the right of it. Um, so it'll be 10, 9, and 11. But it'll, start, it'll always start at the pixel that you specify. Um, and I, I think what you're referring to depends on which direction you're actually drawing the line, if it adds pixels uh, onto the x and the y. OK, so we've got our actual grid drawn. So let's test out our actual, let's test out drawing our, um, or we've, we've drawn the grid lines. Let's test drawing the actual sprites to the grid so we can see that we're um, filling it out. So we have the loop, the nested loop here that we talked about before, where I, I just have a, a series of, uh, of loops. 
Not actually drawing anything currently, just testing for what's in there. Um, just to give it a little bit of test data, I'm going to just kind of fill it with some random information. So here I have a grid that's sort of semi-filled out. So I can see that x in the top left, o in the middle, o in the bottom middle, and an x in the right middle. So that sort of lets us see whether or not we're rendering things appropriately, right? Because if we just draw, if we're just rendering the empty strings and we're not rendering anything when we have an empty string, it's not very useful. So in this case, I'm just going to give it some dummy data. We're not, we don't have a live game. We're not doing anything at the moment with interaction, but we do have something we can test visuals with. So if uh, it's the case that grid at yx is equal to an empty string, don't do anything, of course. But if we want to, uh, if we do have an x there, right, um, we're going to do love.graphics.draw. And so this is where we need to compute where the actual x is going to be physically drawn. So basically we need to do, you know, we need to take into consideration the margin, right, on the y and x. So um, we can compute this in advance. We can say um, draw local x offset is going to be equal to um, the, uh, what is it? Um, Basically, we're in it, we're, we, we do have the x and y margin up above, right? So I can say uh, x margin divided by 2 plus tile grid or grid tile size uh, times x. And so uh, times x minus 1, right? Because pixels, pixel coordinates are based on 0, but tables in Lua, which is kind of a weird thing about Lua, are based on starting at 1, right? So if we're trying to say, um, if we want to draw, for example, the first x in our grid, like uh, the top left uh, corner, top, top left over in this direction, um, it's going to be drawn at whatever the x margin divided by 2 is, and that's it. It's just going to be drawn at that point, right? Because uh, we don't want to draw it, because if we were to add the grid tile size to that, it'll draw it in the second square which is not what we want. We don't want it to draw in that position. So I'm going to, that'll be our y, uh, our y offset, our, our x offset. And the, the y offset is much the same. Tile size times y minus 1. And so these va values are basically, we're just going to add that. We're just going to draw at that location. So if I say love.graphics.draw x sprite at x offset and the y offset, whoops. We should get our x's drawn appropriately. And I can do that with our O sprite here. Run it. And we do indeed have our grid rendering just as it should be. And it looks kind of like trash because I'm not a good artist. But we can see that it, it uh, works appropriately. Now there's an issue where the x's and the, the circles are kind of drawn. Because they're based in their top left coordinate, we're literally drawing right at the top left. We should add a little bit of padding. To the, to the x's and the circles. Well, that's a super easy thing that we can do. The line is drawn for p. Uh, OK, so I don't have to do a shift of the line, like a minus line width minus 2. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Minus line width minus 2. Oh, um, no, no, you don't. I mean, I'm not 100% sure on that. I, I guess I can see where you're coming from. Like if you had a line that was like 10 pixels wide, and you needed to draw, because I think, I do, I do think, now that I think about it a little more, I think the lines are sort of drawn. If they're drawn down, I think they're based on the top left, just like sprites are. So maybe you'd have to do that. You'd have to, you'd have to test it and kind of like draw something in your scene at a particular coordinate, like at 0, 0, or at 10, 10, so you can see what's to the left and to above it. Um, draw like maybe a dot or something, and then draw a thick line at that exact spot. Um, but then maybe draw the dot above the line so you can see where it falls so the line doesn't overwrite the dot. And then if the dot is in the middle of the line, then you'll know that it draws based on the center of the line. And if it's to the, at the very left edge of the line, then you know that the lines start rendering at their top left versus their center. Um, but that's a good point. It's something to definitely consider if you were, if you were doing larger scale sort of shape or vector based um, drawing. I think circles, for example, I think they draw based on their middle. So I'm not sure how it necessarily um, how it necessarily applies to lines. I haven't tested it. Um, Jarnois, oh, I like that solution. 
Um, so we have our we have our uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. we have our x's and circles rendering at the right spots. But what we need to do is shift them a little bit down into the right, basically, because they are drawing at their top left, and they're not filling, they're not center filling their grid indices, right? And so all we have to do to do that is just we know that our sprites are 32 pixels by 32 pixels, and we know that uh, our grid spaces are 40 pixels, which gives us eight pixels difference on the x and the y. And if we're going to draw them in the center, then we just basically need to subtract half of that extra space, um, which is four pixels, to get the amount that we offset them by and the positive y in x direction. So we can just say plus four. And if I wanted to, I could say sprite padding. And then at the very top, over here, say sprite padding is equal to four. And if I render this, now we have our x's and circles center filling the grid perfectly. So awesome, we've come a long way. We have uh, pretty much everything sort of working render-wise. The tricky part comes into play when we want to actually decide where to draw these x's and circles, where to place them, and how to figure out you know, who, uh, whose turn it is, right? So what we can do and we're just going to sort of figure this out as we go. But I can say current player, local current player equals 1. And so current player will be either 1 or 2. If it's 1, player 1 gets to go. And we can assume that the human is player 1. Player 2 can be maybe an AI, maybe the other player. Maybe we'll have time to implement both. Um, tick, 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 50. Now on Steam for, uh, what does that say? 59.99 alpha release. Yeah, early access tic-tac-toe. Body A2610, unrelated question for chat. We want to make a school project to detect phone in hand while driving. Camera will be mounted on top, and if AI recognizes a phone on the photo, it makes alarm. Question is, where do we train our AI? Google Cloud is cool, but we have a trouble to get money. Uh, that's a good question that I am not qualified to answer. If somebody in the chat is qualified to answer, definitely, uh, definitely provide some suggestions to Body A2610. Nick Wong is uh, one of the people that works with us doing streaming. He'll be streaming on Friday. And he did a basic binary classifier in TensorFlow last week. And so he'd be the one to ask, possibly, if he's on stream again. Definitely tune in and maybe shout, uh, you know, ask him that question. I, unfortunately, cannot provide you an answer to that. Um, so we're going to say current player is equal to 1. And let's say, let's do the keyboard version, I, I think, for now. So the keyboard version will make it kind of nice and easy to do this. So, so we have our draw grid. And if we want to visibly see whose turn it is, we should first start by probably drawing the uh, actual like whose turn it is as text on the screen. So we can maybe say love.graphics.print. Player dot dot um, current player dot dot is turn um, and that'll just draw at zero zero, so it's player one's turn. So we can we can visibly see that it's it's clear it's obvious. We'll we'll use that for now because current player the variable is set to one. You could maybe say, if the phone screen is on and the accelerometer is greater than 15 miles an hour, play the alarm. Yeah, in a nutshell, the, the simple, the simple uh, logic there. The, uh, the greater problem, I think, is he's referring to, he or she is referring to, is the, uh, the actual OCR that you need to um, detect whether somebody has a phone in their hand. Uh, and you'd have to train a, an agent to detect that. There are a lot of OCR libraries. I think OpenCV is a library that Nick Wong has definitely talked about. And I don't know what goes into, I guess you'd have to feed an AI bot like thousands of images of people using a cell phone or holding a cell phone in their hand. And it would get tough detecting like whether they're holding a, a, uh, a wallet or their keys or something else. Like there's a lot of, a lot of different, um, Variables, I think, that go into something like that, which makes it a fairly complex 
thing to program. Uh, okay. So we have a bit of text that tells us whose player, whose turn it is. So we're just going to go with the model that someone else suggested. I forgot who who recommended it in the chat. I'm going to just let me just let me, let me do that. Let me figure figure that out. Uh, Coral say, who used only the keyboard. So we'll do that. We'll say we'll basically use this love dot key pressed um, callback handler. So that we don't have to write any update code in our in our application at all, because nothing is ever really based on time. So Coralse has a point when they say that the um, uh, we only need to use the key pressed callback. Uh, Coralse says I can upload it to GitHub if you want. Sure, you feel free to do that and put it to the people in chat. Uh, we'll implement it from scratch here um, from the bottom up, just so we can see how it works. I get it now, so for traffic light cams. Yes, I think that's what he's referring to. And Nadani says, the phone being on doesn't mean the same as the phone in the hand. Correct. Yeah, someone could have their phone in their hand and maybe just be putting it, like moving it. Maybe it fell or something. Um, typically, probably the phone being in their hand will mean that they're using it or plan on using it, I would imagine, but I'm not an expert. OK, so love.keypressed key. So we want to keep track of. We want the user to be able to select a, a grid tile that they're going to put their next character on, right? So another thing that we're going to have to keep track of is sort of like what is that tile? What is the currently selected tile, right? So local selected x is equal to 1, or selected x selected y is equal to 1, 1. And then down here where we actually have the bit of code that draws the sprite itself, since we're already uh, figuring out what the offset is on our for our sprite, where we need to draw it, right? Yeah, Corral say, yeah, definitely. Yeah, sh feel free to toss it in the chat if, if people want to take a look at it, um, even, if, even if just to see what somebody else's implementation looks like to demonstrate that you can do this in multiple ways. That would, I'm sure that would be helpful to some people. Definitely do, definitely do toss that in the chat. Um, so we're already figuring out where the offset, the x, y offset is for our grid when we draw the sprite. We can use that information to draw a maybe a transparent rectangle over the currently drawn sprite. So as soon as the sprite gets drawn, we can also say, actually draw a um, draw a rectangle here, right? So I can actually get rid of this sprite padding bit of code here then, and just here here, here, and here, say plus sprite padding using a cool feature of VS Code and many other text editors where you can have multiple cursors and write in multiple locations. I'm going to put the sprite padding only on the sprites being drawn themselves. So still works just the same. But now I can say love.graphics.rectangle. First, I'm going to say love.graphics.setColor. And I want this to be 1, 1, 1, but I want it to be like 0.25 on the alpha because I want it to be semi-transparent. So remember, it takes in a value between 1 and 0. So I'm going to say 1, 1, 1, 0 0.25, so about a, quarter trans about a quarter opaque, so mostly transparent. And I'm going to say love.graphics.rectangle at x offset, y offset, uh, and then we're going to say grid tile size, grid tile size. And this is the width and height parameters. And the last thing that grid, uh, that love.graphics.rectangle takes as its first parameter is a string that specifies the draw mode. In this case, we want it to be fill. And then after that's done, we want to make sure to set the color back to 1111 so that anything we draw after that gets drawn at the appropriate color. And if we run this, um, it is not drawing appropriately, so let me make sure. Uh, first of all, am I running the correct version of love? I should be, right? Running version 11. Oh, because I'm drawing it over everything, right? Yeah, so in this case, I want to say um, if x is equal to selected x and y is equal to selected y, 
then do all of that. Otherwise, we're going to draw it for every single index, and that's not useful. And so notice that now um, we can see that it actually draws the, um, it draws the x highlighted a different color, but it's not drawing a square throughout the entire grid section. So we should figure out why that actually is. So we are drawing the rectangle appropriately. If I were to draw this at, um, if I were to say, if I were to make it green, for example, so make it uh, like that, and then draw it. Oh, it is drawing. It's just not very visible. OK. Oh, you can kind of see it. If you look really closely, well, it looks like it's drawing lines, actually. That's very strange. OK. So if I were to make this at 0.5, would that make it easier to see? Ah, OK. So it's just the case that it's kind of hard to see. It, for some reason, draws it as kind of hard to see. So now we can see that we do have, the, um, we do have a selected um, grid index. It's just kind of tough to see at 0.25 transparency. But if we draw it at, uh, if we draw it at 0.5 transparency, we can see where we want to draw. Because okay, the background is black. Yeah, at 0.25, because the background is black, it's hard to see. 0.5 seems to work pretty well. Cool, so that works. So love.keypress then. So we want to change, want to be able to change which index we're selecting. So we can say if, in our key press function, we can say if key is equal to left, then um, if selected x is uh, greater than 1, right? Because if we're at 1, we don't want to be able to go left. We can say selected x equals selected x minus 1. Uh, else if, uh, oops, uh, wrong place. Else if key is equal to right, then do the same thing. If selected x is greater or uh, is less than 3, Selected x equals selected x plus 1. Else if key is equal to uh, left, right, up. If selected y is greater than 1, selected y equals selected y minus 1. And then lastly, else if key is equal to down. Uh, if the selected y is less than 3, Selected y is equal to selected y plus 1. If we run this, I can now move my thing around. And I cannot move it uh, beyond the grid, the sections of the grid that, uh, that are laid out on the screen. So I'm pressing right a bunch of times, can't go any farther. Pressing left a bunch of times, can't go any farther. Up a bunch of times, can't go any farther. But I can freely move around all of the index in the actual grid itself. So super easy. Um, why is the font so blurry? Because the, it's a, not, a, not a retro, not a very um, uh, conducive font to low resolution. So if we were to go to fonts, basically a lot of fonts are aliased, meaning that their, their pixels are semi-transparent in places to make it look smooth when you view it at a high resolution. But since we're viewing it at a very small resolution, the aliasing looks like blurriness. And it's, actually, it's still pixelated and it's very crisp. But because they're transparent, they do look blurry. Um, so what we can do is go over to um, dafont.com. And what I like to do, go to the, the, the pixel bitmap section here. There's a bunch of really good retro fonts that we can use. And you can see what their licenses are on the right side. So let's find something that's maybe like an 8 pixel font. So like this is pretty good, 8-bit wonder. Uh, and it's 100% free, so let's download it. I download 8-bit wonder. You'll get a, a TTF file, so this is what, what it looks like here. This one kind of looks like, uh, I guess, kind of uh, not really like Minecraft, but you know, same kind of idea. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna put this into my um, f uh, another f subfolder in my project called Fonts. I'm gonna paste it in there, and I'm going to just call it 8-bit. Dot .ttf, just going to keep it all capital, uh, all lowercase. Now if I go back to my project, 
and I go to up here where I have my assets. Remember, I, I set aside a little chunk of my main.lua for assets only. I'm going to say, <coughs> excuse me, local font, uh, local retro font is equal to love.graphics.newfont fonts slash 8bit.ttf. <coughs> excuse me. And then here in the love.load, I can say love.graphics. I'm going to do up here, actually. Love.graphics.set default font, or set font, sorry. And then I'm going to set it to retro font. So retro font being the font object that we created with the love.graphics.new font. And then uh, we can see that even that is, uh, oh, because we didn't specify the size. So you can specify a size. By default, I think it's 16. I'm going to set a, an 8 pixel size on the, on the font. And then if I do that, we can see that it is indeed a small font. However, the apostrophe looks screwed up because I guess that font doesn't come with an apostrophe. Uh, I didn't realize that. But yeah, now that I'm looking at it, I can see it does not come with an apostrophe. Um, maybe something like this one, press start to player. This one does come with an apostrophe. We'll do that. I'm going to copy that. Go back over to here, dev, um, streams, tic-tac-toe, fonts, paste. And I'm just going to call this press start.ttf. Go back here, replace this with press start, run it. And now we get a nice crisp player one's turn at the top left. And it doesn't, uh, yeah, in that case, the, the, I think there's some, something weird with how it's, um, the 8 pixel font looks with that particular font. But if you're looking at this font, the, this one is actually rendering the way it should be. Um, and it's quite up on the, on the top left edge. So what I'm going to do is where we draw that actual line of text, um, I'm going to specify that it should draw at 1, 1. And so now it's not quite up against that top left corner. It's just slightly off of it. So it looks kind of nice. So yeah, it, does, it, look, it looks damn retro, says JP guy. Yes, it does. That's like an NES, it's like an NES font, it looks like. Um, maybe make it automatically skip the tiles that are filled in. Um, I think that's a feature. We'll, it's, a good, it's a good idea. It's a feature that I think we'll probably not implement today. Um, but you could do that if you uh, just basically say, if the, um, I guess it would just be like a, another, uh, an and. I guess we could do something like that, right? We could say, if selected x is greater than 1 and, uh, well, it would be a little bit semi-complicated. You basically have to introduce like a loop in here and say, if, uh, uh, if the selected tile, or if grid at y, x is greater than, um, at selected x, selected y, selected x is equal to empty string, else if that plus, if selected x plus 1 is less than, three or greater than one, then check to see. It just gets a little bit complicated. Good idea. What we'll end up doing instead is when we actually check when they press the button to place down the tile, we'll check to see whether that tile is equal to the empty string and let them know if not. Um, OK. So let's initialize the table to nothing. And I'm going to listen for the key. Um, I'm going to make it an else statement so that they can't move and press the key at the same time. I'm going to say else if the key is equal to space, then uh, if grid at selected y, selected x is equal to empty string, then if, um, or I should say grid selected y, selected x is equal to, um, ah, that's a little bit too more complicated than it needs to be. If grid, uh, if current player is equal to 1, then else, and we'll say if it's equal to 1, grid selected y selected x is going to be equal to x. Otherwise, it's going to be equal to circle. So now we can move around. And if it's an empty square, we can press X or circle. And that will change 
whose turn it is. And we can say current player is equal to 2, current player is equal to 1, right? So now it'll change who the next player is and therefore allow it to update every single, uh, every single time I press, enter, uh, press space bar. So it's empty right now. We're at player 1, so we should press an X, which we did. Perfect. So it's player 2's turn, which I can't press anything here. But if I go up over here, uh, I, get a, I get an error. OK, let's see. What, what did I do wrong? Main 79. Oh, whoops. Missed an X. Uh, Ashley, Ashley uh, caught that before I did. So good job. Uh, let's try that again. X, circle. Perfect. And it went back to player 1's turn. So x, circle, and then x. However, we do not have, uh, Sheer Paladin says you forgot selected z. Selected z would be uh, pretty, uh, a pretty intense uh, game of 3D tic-tac-toe. Um, I'm guessing you meant selected x? <laughs> Sheer Paladin says damn typo. You typed it in twice. That's OK. Now, I appreciate it. Um, th that's an interesting idea, though. 3D tic-tac-toe would be pretty sweet. I'm not going to lie. So we do have the ability to now place the tiles in the right spot. But we're not checking win conditions. So that's the next important thing. Now we, <laughs> we play tic-tac-toe in 3Ds as Jordan Way, yeah. Uh, maybe an, a, that'd be a cool Unity stream, actually. I, I'm going to think about that. That'd be, that'd be a pretty cool thing to implement. 3D tic-tac-toe. Um, OK. So here we can say um, check victory. Let's just make a function called check victory. And at the very bottom, I'm going to make a new function called check victory. And this check victory function is just basically going to do all the different ways that we can. Uh, it's going to basically look through our grid, all eight ways that we can possibly make a, a win. So three checks on the horizontal rows, three checks on the vertical rows, and then the two diagonals that are possible, right? So. We can say um, check the three horizontal rows, check three vertical rows, and then check two diagonal rows. Diagonal uh, rows, but uh, they're not really rows, I guess. Um, and these are columns. So let's say for x is equal to 1 until the grid width do um, no sorry for y is equal to one until grid height do if um, and we're basically we're going to do this for all three and then we're going to say um, local uh, win is equal to true. We're going to say, is there a win in this slot, right? And then um, we can say, basically, we're going to assume that there's a victory. And if it's the case that there is a space in that row, or we detect that the character isn't the same as the first character, then um, it's, not, it's not a victory, right? So we'll say local first character equals um, first character is equal to grid y1, right? So this will be for every single row in our grid. And then we'll say if first character um, is equal to uh, just the empty string, then obviously it's not a, it's not a, a, a victory, right? So we'll just return if, um, and then we'll say for x is equal to 1 until the grid width do, or equal to 2 until the grid width, because we already got the first one, right? We'll say if um, grid at yx is, equal, is uh, not equal to first character, then return. That's all I need to do, right? So the same logic sort of applies for the vertical rows. So I can say 
Uh, in this case, we're going to start it from the, we're going to go over the x, because we need to iterate over the columns now. We're going column by column, so we're going to go uh, or iterate through the, uh, the x direction. And then for each x, we're going to iterate down the individual column indices. So we'll say grid width, and then 1x, right? Because we get the first, the, the top column, and then we're going to iterate whichever, depending on which column we're on on the x-axis, is going to be this, uh, this x value here. And then for y is 2 until the grid height, we'll do that. And that's the same thing as the um, effectively checking for the rows. So we got rows, we got columns. And then for diagonal, I can say for, um, and this is going to go 1, 1, 1. Um, basically, I'll, I'll just say um, if uh, Um, ba, 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 ba. Oh, and if uh, and we do want to return, and if it's the case that um, that we didn't return, oh wait, no, we don't want to return, right? Because we're iterating through all of this. No, what we want to do is we want to say local um, local win is equal to um, false. And then if it's the case that, uh, bah, bah, bah. so I want to assume that there isn't a win. Assume no victory. And then if victory, then um, we want to say um, local, or we want to say uh, game over is equal to true. And then winning player is equal to um, uh, ba, 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 ba. We basically want to keep track of the winning character. So local winning character is equal to empty string. Sorry, I'll pay, pay attention to the chat here. Um, checking the two diagonals would do. Yeah, well, we're going to check the two diagonals at the last part of the of the uh, of the block of code. VS Code is great, but if you want to spend 37 hours loading your IDE, you can use the VS Community instead. Yeah, that's true. It, it does take quite a long time. Uh, Major Fott says, I think we can do it as one Boolean expression since we don't need it to be scalable, and there are only three cells each segment. We could do that. Um, the reason that we're doing it this way is in case somebody did want to implement like a five by five or a ten by ten tic tac toe. This is just a little bit more of a better engineered way to do it. Sure, Paladin, can you guys explain the difference between an editor and an IDE? Yeah, an editor is more just for text editing, so making an actual source file. An IDE typically has debugging and profiling, um, a lot more fancy stuff for you know, testing your applications before deploying them, building applications for building executables for applications, things like that. Um, yeah, Jardin Wah has a, uh, Jordan Wah says much the same. Bav Ignite says, I already want to use Vim terminal for multiple languages to ditch using separate IDEs for different things. Yeah, it depends on what you're trying to do, definitely. Um, there are nice built-in features of a lot of IDEs, like v a Visual Studio and like things for Java development. But Vim is perfectly great for a lot of stuff. Um, I use the VS version that comes from for free with Unity. It's amazingly fast in loading, responding, and everything. And I'm not on a fast computer, says Irene. Yeah, it's gotten faster for sure. It used to be. I mean, it depends on what application you're building. But I think I, I tested v Visual Studio Community on Mac that came with Unity as well. And it was much faster than it used to be. Um, I think it's going to depend. Your mileage may vary, basically. OK, so our victory, our victory function here. Um, in this case, checking uh, y horizontal rows and checking x vertical columns. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Um, if the first character is that, then break. Can we do that? Uh, we want to continue, right? Not break. The thing about Lua, unfortunately, is it doesn't have 
uh, a continue statement. So we have to use something called a go to statement using a symbol, which can be a little bit tricky. Let me just make sure I'm walking through this correctly. So for each row, for every y, we want to assume a win. Um, And the first character of each row is going to be a, oh, we want to continue. That's what it is. Um, right. So in this case, we would say something like go to and then continue. And then we would say continue. And then here, before the continue, is where we would actually say, um, uh, win is true, winning character is equal to uh, first character. And actually, what we could do here is just say, um, we don't even need to detect it, because we, we're just going to detect the one victory, right? So if we detect a victory in this case, then what we can do instead is say, we can do what we do here at the bottom. We can say, game over is true. Right, we'll do that. Game over is true, and then the winning character, winning player, is going to be um, first character, right? And then first character we can say is equal to um, x um, and uh, one or two. And what this does is this is the equivalent of a ternary operator in uh, Java or C or C++, but Lua doesn't have that, so you need to use and or. It basically returns the first, uh, I forget the exact semantics offhand, but it returns the first truthy value, um, or the first falsy value, I think, in a, um, The last truthy value and the first false and the last falsy value for and and or respectively. It have to, it's been a, a little bit since I've looked at it, but effectively you can visualize it as being uh, question mark colon the ternary operator that you would see in a uh, in a more compiled language like C sharp or C plus plus or Java, any of those other things. So basically, what we're saying is the winning player, if the first character is equal to uh, to x, then we know that that's going to be a uh, player one, and if not then it's going to be player two, which means that we got circles, right? And this continue statement will only uh, is going to happen after that. So basically, we can get through this whole block of code, right? And we'll do the same thing here. So go to continue. So this go to statement, go to is typically something that is not looked upon well um, because it can do a lot of bad things. You can make your code very hard to follow and make what's called spaghetti code, where you have jumps all over your code in sort of non-structured non ways. Um, so it's frowned upon in software engineering, but if you use it in the context of a continue statement like you would use in C or C++ or Java or C Sharp, then it's a perfectly valid use case. And this is to sort of get around the limitation that Lua has of not being a, um, uh, of not having the continue statement. It doesn't have it as part of the language, so you have to implement it yourself using go to. So go to just means go directly to the symbol that I've called continue. And to designate the symbol, you need to use double colons effectively. Um, and we do the same thing here. So we can just copy this. Boop. And now hopefully that doesn't cause issues. So it might be the case that this, because it, it, it needs multiple continue, we're going to have multiple continue symbols in our code. So let's, let's rename them. So we'll say um, continue horizontal for this one. Continue horizontal. And then we'll call this one continue vertical. And we'll say go to continue vertical. Go to continue vertical. And that should be exactly what we want. And then let's check the diagonals. So if, uh, so this is where we would need another sort of loop over our, our code. Uh, what is this Fortran? Yeah, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird thing that, that's specific to Lua. Uh, way easier to just have one editor for all languages, um, says Sure Paladin. Yeah, no, definitely. 
Lord Squirrel. Hey, have you seen the pull request I made on the Love 2D Pokemon repo? I have not. I will take a look at it. Thank you. Uh, El Jardinois. All possible victories must contain the center plus the sign. So you could really just check for the nearest plus and minus neighbors on each of those five blocks. Must contain the center plus sign. Um, uh, can you elaborate on that? Because if you mean the center of the grid, then that doesn't take into consideration the very far left and far right um, columns and the top and bottom rows. It's like a choose your own adventure in programming, except the adventures are errors. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. Sorry if you made a plus sign from the blocks. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, El Jardinois, if I follow what you mean. If you're referring to the center grid part, you very well may have a point that I'm just not understanding, but I'm not sure I follow at the moment. The last thing that we need to do is sort of iterate from the top left to the bottom right. So um, we can say for, um, and this will be an iteration of, so we'll say local top left equals 1, top right, oops, top left, top right equals 1, 1. We'll say for um, y is equal to, um, or rather, top. I guess this needs to be um, oh, it'll be the same. So we'll just say, well, if we're going from the top left to the bottom right, it'll always be one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. So we can say um, local diagonal is equal to one. And we'll just say four um, i is equal to diagonal uh, to till the grid, or rather, <laughs> okay. Sorry, say for diagonal is equal to 1 until the grid uh, tile size, or sorry, grid, I guess in this case it doesn't matter, grid height, probably. Although, yeah, this will only work for perfectly square grids. Uh, for diagonal is equal to 1 until the grid height, we're going to say, um, basically do all the same thing more or less. We'll say blah, blah, blah. first character is going to be equal to grid 1, 1. And we'll say if it's equal to that, then uh, we can return, not return, but we can go to uh, after diagonal. So this would be after, whoops, and this doesn't need colons. I don't believe you need colons. You just need to reference the symbol. So we'll say uh, after diagonal. Oh, wait, no, no, no. We'll just say, uh, <laughs> sorry, avoid go. I'm in the habit now of using go to. We don't want to do that. We'll say that um, and then else. So this is the, uh, so if we did get a invalid character, Again, now I'm, now I'm all jumbled up. OK, so if it's equal to colon, um, basically do nothing. Else, do the actual calculation to uh, you know, row and column by column. And then uh, let's comment here, from top left to bottom right. And then from bottom left to top right, or I guess uh, what would it be? It would, no, it would be 1, 3, 2, 2. It would be a minus and a plus on the, if we're going from the bottom right to the top, bottom left to the top right, we're starting at 1, 3 and going to 2, 2 and then 3, 1. So we're adding to the x, minusing from the y. So we can say, um, ba, 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 ba. We'll just say local uh, match is equal to true. And we'll say if, if match then, well, we want to do what we did before. So we set uh, this. 
So we set the game over to true, winning player to the first character, uh, the correct winning player. And then we say if um, grid at diagonal diagonal is equal to first character, then what we're going to do is, um, or what we should say, if it's not equal, then we want to um, break. We want to finish this loop, which will come down uh, and set match is equal to false. And then we'll just break. We'll cut out of the loop. We'll come down here. If it's equal to a match, then we'll set game over. Otherwise, we won't. And then we're going to kind of want to do the same thing here. So we'll say local match is equal to true. So this is a bit of a long function. I've uh, got a bunch of comments. My suggestion would be to check the victory condition upon submitting an X or an O rather than after each turn, uh, which we are doing. So here we are only checking the victory when they press space, and the space is equal to the empty string uh, JP. Call num is equal to row num. Yep, that's what we use diagonal to localize the validation. Not the center grid, but the second row and second column and the cross shape that they make. All victories must contain grid spots from that row or column. So you can just check those five squares for neighboring matches. Well, matches that are plus or minus one in each x and y position. Um, I think I know what you mean. I think. I'm not sure if it's any better. Babignite diagonal to center grid row column equals center grid. Yep. That would work too. And again, that's that would be that would work for a three by three. We're purposefully making this applicable towards an x by x grid, so we could do this for a ten by ten, just making it a little bit more flexible. Oh, I see, Jardinois. I see what you mean, or uh, JP guy. What you mean by your checking the. Uh, the um, only the neighboring ones based on where you place it. I get it. I get what you mean now. Yeah, you could do it that way for sure. Um, okay, let's go back down to check victory. Probably should have made these separate functions. So we could do something like, um, do I need local? Do I need this? I don't think we need this, right? I don't think we need those variables. Um, and so the nice thing then, I can just I can do this. I'm going to check horizontals, right? Come down here, function check horizontals. And now if I'm correct, I can get rid of, I, I don't have to worry about this continue horizontal thing because it's in its own function. So now I can just use continue like we did before, which is proper. Uh, check verticals. Let's do that. Okay, boom. Function check verticals. Do that. Let's get rid of continue vertical. Make that can just continue. So now that's a little bit cleaner. And then uh, check diagonals. Uh, sorry, up here. Okay, so now we've taken out all that code. We sort of broke it up into three pieces because it's getting a bit large. So if you notice that your function kind of can be broken up into separate parts and it's getting a bit cumbersome, definitely uh, split up your code in separate functions just to make it a little bit easier to read and easier to uh, um, debug and reason about. So now we have three functions that are all kind of similar, um, but now it's just a nice check victory, just a nice three statements. And then each of these subroutines you can go into and debug separately. Um, we're not finished implementing the diagonals, though. So what we want to do is let's assume a match. And same thing that we did here before. We can basically just copy this. It's going to be a little bit different. So blah, blah, blah. First character is equal to empty string. Yep, do nothing. Um, and then for, so in this case, what we want to do is I basically want to say, um, 
I want to have, um, so I'm not going to have diagonal anymore. I'm going to have a separate variable. I'm going to say, I'm going to call it local, um, I'm just going to make local xy um, equal to 1, 3. And then I'm going to say um, for i is equal to 1 and then uh, rather for, uh, actually, no, I can make this, if it's 1, 3, I can say, um, I can say 2, 2, right? 2, 2. Because we already established that the first character is going to be equal to, um, oh, we have to actually assign the first character, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first character is going to be equal to grid at uh, 3, 1, right? Or actually, in this case, because we want it to be variable, we're going to say grid height 1. So in this case, uh, we're going to start it at the very bottom left of our grid, so it's fairly flexible. And then if the first character is equal to empty string, it's fine. Uh, do nothing. This won't, uh, this won't set any values. If it, and then we're going to do a loop. So we're going to start it at, we're going to go to 2, 2 now. So this will be in the middle of our grid. So for i is equal to, or rather I should say, um, yeah, we can do for i is equal to grid height minus 1 until, um, or rather, 2 uh, grid height minus 1. So we're starting at basically where we are. Actually, no, 1 until grid height minus 1. And then this is going to iterate twice. So this will iterate however many times more we should go in our grid beyond just the, the first character. So for i is uh, 1 until grid height minus 1, we are going to say um, if grid at yx uh, is not equal to the first character, right? Then we can just uh, break, right? And then if it's the case that we did get all the way to, um, uh, oh, that's going to be a little bit trickier, right? What do we do up here? We said, oh, because we assume match is equal to true, right? So we're just going to say match is equal to false. And then we need to actually increase the variable. So we need to say y is equal to, uh, y minus 1 and x is equal to x plus 1 because we're going from the bottom left to the top right. So we need to subtract our y and add to the x. And that'll give us, that'll get us to the top right eventually of our grid. Um, and we can break out of that. If match, blah, blah, blah. Awesome. So eventually we'll get a match and it'll be game over, or we'll have some global variable called game over, which will be equal to true. And then winning player will be equal to some character. It will be equal to some number, one or two, right? So let's go ahead and create that. I'm going to say uh, local. Oops, I'm going to make it after my data structures over here. So winning player is equal to 0, right? And then game over will be equal to false. And it should be the case that uh, we're going to surround all of our input in, a, in an if statement. So if not game over, then do all of that stuff. And th this means that if it is game over, we can't actually move our grid around at all. So we're just going to say um, we're just going to block input at that point. And then if we are if we do have a winner, we're going to say if um, game over, then else. And our else is the, going to say the turn. But if there's a game over, instead we're going to say love.graphics.print player, uh, winning player wins. Right? So now we can see if, uh, if this works. So uh, do expect it. So 208. Oh, sorry. Four statements have a do, not a then. 
Let's make sure I did that in all my four, four loops. Make sure your for loop is a do. I did it for some of them. And I started to get a little bit uh, mess up, messy with the syntax there. Let's try that again. All right, so now we see player one's turn. So if I X, uh, sorry, space bar, space bar, space bar, space bar, and then space bar, player one wins. So the logic works. So it's iterating over that particular row. And then if I try to move around, I can't actually move around, but I can hit escape. Let's try it with a, a vertical match now. So let's try something like this. Oops, sorry, I screwed that one up. OK, player one wins. Awesome. Let's let, uh, let's let player two win, and let's let it be a diagonal match. So let's do that. Player two wins, and it's a diagonal match. Awesome. So I think it's pretty safe to say that it works. Um, let's go ahead. Let me read some of these comments. I'm sorry, I kind of went into the zone there. Um, I'm trying to go back all the way up here. Let's see. Yeah, it's only tic-tac-toe. It's not like this is going to get scaled up to a billion by a billion square grids. Yeah, no, that, that's true. Uh, but I think it, it was an interesting way to sort of look at it programmatically. and Because it's very easy just to have an if, L, an if and something and something and something and then make it a win condition. Um, but it's just it's kind of a little bit less than ideal. So taking a look at it in case you do want to scale it, I think is definitely worthwhile. Um, but you could definitely, if you know for sure that you're only going to have a 3x3 three three grid, then yeah, you, do, you, do, you don't need to parameterize it at all. Um, uh, Jay Lardinois says, this is random, but what do you use to keep your hair up like that? My hair is really heavy and doesn't hold. Uh, so there's, this, there's a volumizing hair gel called Big Sexy Hair Volumizing Blow Dry Gel. Um, definitely try that out. Uh, some Axe Messy Hair, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, it's not wax, what is it? Uh, it's a pomade or whatever that, uh, that stuff is called. Some of that and then a little bit of hairspray. So fashion, fashion, fashion stream. Uh, 10 by 10 grids, we can apply concepts of recursion instead of loops. It'd be good practice to think recursively. That is kind of hard for me to come to naturally. Um, recursive for this particular application, I'm not sure if I, uh, I would think to use a recursive algorithm, because iteratively, you can think of it much the same way, and I think it's easier. Um, for checking diagonals, if the center block isn't checked, it must be false. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but we still want to know who, who we are matching with. But you could definitely do a quick and easy if there is no center block, there is no uh, center diagonal match as another if statement to, as an optimization. Uh, I thought recursive algorithms were generally less efficient than iterative ones. Um, I think that that is probably often true, but I don't think it's, I don't know, I'd have to, I'd have to see. It's, it uses more memory. I'm not sure if it's more, less efficient. I think you can replace grid diagonal diagonal with grid diagonal grid height minus diagonal, and it will work, says Mage Um Grid height minus diagonal. Why would we do that? I don't think that would work, right? Let me see, where, where was that? That was down in diagonal, right? So the, the, the logic of that is we're going from the, from the top left to the bottom right. So we want x and y to increase. And so if grid height, if we're going, oh, do you mean, um, oh, I, I see what you mean. Um, It would have to be grid height minus diagonal. Uh, you mean you, you're talking about for the other direction, for going from the bottom left to the top right. For that, you would have to also make sure that you give it at least one. So if we're starting it, if it's, it would have to be plus one to that. But yeah, that plus one would work. Only if you have an odd number board. If you have, say, a four by four board, there's no center block. Oh, that's a good point, says Irene. Yeah, that's true. Uh, recursive algorithms would make more sense when the grid's number, when the name Grid number grows. Hey, you guys remember that Pazak game from Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic? Anybody want to whip up a standalone version of that with me, says Jardinois? I actually am not, not familiar with what that is. 
If you do an iterative and localized check around the axis zero that you've just submitted, you're at most looking at a subspace of three by three squares or however many you've got to get in a row high. Whereas if you implement a recursive but global algorithm on the whole grid, it checks the whole grid. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are a lot of fancy ways we could do it. We did a very sort of crude and simple way today. I always forget to add that thanks to the uh, add do thanks to Python. Yeah, the, I, Python's probably what I program in the most, but um, I occasionally slip up on some simple syntax with, with Lua as well. It's, it's all too easy. Uh, if you have a larger board, you will have to search pretty much the whole board at submitting anyway, at least that full row and column. Since any human playable game would hardly be more than 100 and 100, and that's quite a lot, this is mostly premature optimization. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's cool to think about sort of things like that, but realistically, it's not something you need to worry about at all. Even when you get up to 100 by 100, it's still going to be extremely fast to iterate over 100 things. Um, uh, well, that wouldn't be 100. I guess it would be an n squared problem because you're doing, well, would it be? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be an n squared problem, um, but you're still not looking at any human limitation. You're not, you're not looking at anything that would realistically be an actual hurdle. Um, it would be. It would still be very fast. Um, D Coffee, Dan Coffee, who was in the chat yesterday, plus one on the hair. He says, uh, "Shout out to everyone! Give a shout out to Dan for his stream yesterday on uh, on Draw 50." Which, uh, again, if anybody missed earlier, this is what uh, Draw50 is. And Dan talked to us yesterday about how to implement it. Um, I understand that it's a bit of overkill to be discussing efficiency in such a small scale game, but I still believe you wouldn't have to check the whole column or row. But I have to write it out to make sure if I'm not wrong. Yeah, you, you're probably onto something. I, uh, at the top of my head, I'm not sure either, but uh, you know, definitely write it out if you want to. Uh, what do you think the last implementation to check, win or lose? Hello. Hello, Jason. Good to see you. But you need to check the whole row or column to make sure you have a win. Of course, you can always tell early if you haven't. I do understand that checking the row, column, and diagonal, if there's one for the last X or circle has been placed, can make the checking faster. Yep, it can make, yeah, it can make the checking faster. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, that's an optimization that we did not make, but we certainly could. You can narrow the scope at which you're at least checking. Uh, I believe you just keep track of how many X or zeros you can find in a single direction before finding the opposite symbol or the edge of the grid. If you run into such a situation, you can check for the same condition, the opposite direction. And if at the end counter is equal to the required amount, then win, but it's total overkill. Yeah. Something that you would not need to worry about for this, but it is an optimization we could certainly make if we were maybe programming for like an actual really old console or something. Maybe that would be worth looking at, but on a really old console, you wouldn't fit tic-tac-toe more than three by three anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, OK, cool. So we got the whole game pretty much working. Let me commit this. Um, git status, git add dot. Bad practice, don't do that. Git commit um, working game with humans. Git push. Um, Something we could maybe look at would be like a little bit of AI. So Bella Kira says, hello, Dan. Shout out to Dan Coffee. Andre, as far as efficiency or lack thereof of recursive solutions goes, it depends a lot on a bunch of factors. A very important one is whether the compiler performs tail call optimization, in which case tail recursive functions can be optimized to use a single stack frame. Correct. I'm not sure about Lua, but I do know that Python and Java do not support tail call optimization. I'm not sure off the top of my head either uh, whether Lua does or not. Um, but yes, that is a, that is a good point. OK, so just for fun, maybe we can do a simple, um, a simple AI. So let's see. If we, uh, if we have a, we, in our check victory function, we do that. We, we can then do, um, uh, If um, we'll say if AI player then and then take AI turn, right? And then we'll say if not AI player then do all of this. So actually take the. Ba -ba -ba.
in which case if it takes the AI turn, it'll instantly go from current player to player one again. So this will actually not fire. Um, so we can actually just do this. We, we don't have to do the AI player check. We can just implement it like this. So if uh, we have a current player equals one, which will be the human playing, and uh, after we check victory, we'll you know, determine whether the victory was true or not. So what we should do is we should say if check victory, um, then do nothing. Um, else, if AI player then take AI turn. Because if we uh, let the AI take its turn after the player is gone, even when the player's got a victory, it'll cause some issues. So let's just make sure, um, check whether we have a victory. Oh, I guess we could just do, um, no, we could just do this. We'll just say check player, sorry. We'll say uh, check victory. And then if winning player, or if uh, game over, um, or if not game over, I should say, and AI player then. Because we can get a game over set in our check victory function. Um, and if it's not the case that we have a game over and we're playing with an AI player, then the AI should take its turn. All right. So let's go ahead and create that new variable. So local AI player is equal to true, just for testing. And then let's have a function called uh, take AI turn. And we'll just have a very simple function for now that just says, um, We'll just, we'll, our current AI will just be random. So we'll just say, uh, math.randomseedos.time. This will make sure that our random number generator generates random numbers differently every single time. And so we're going to go down to back to our function. And we're going to say um, local. Or we're going to say uh, local placed turn or took turn is equal to false. While not took turn, do um, local xy is equal to math.random grid height, or sorry, grid width math.random grid height. And then we're going to say if grid y x is equal to that, to the empty string, we're going to say um, uh, bah, 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 bah. oh, and then also after the uh, took a term, we need to check victory again. I realize check victory again. Take a uh, blah blah blah. Once that's all done, also we need to say current player equals one. Um, yes, current player is equal to one. So we're going to say, while we didn't take our turn, we're going to generate a random xy value. And we're going to look and see if in the grid it's an empty space. If it is, grid y x is equal to circle. And um, took turn is equal to true. And if it's not the case, then it's going to come down to here. Took turn still going to be false. We're going to loop back again. And it's going to generate another random x, y variable. So completely random. Um, we'll see how it works. Let's run our game. I'm going to take my turn. And the AI took its turn in the bottom middle. OK, let's try, uh, let's try here. Oh, not a very smart AI. And so therefore, I win. So the next step would probably be if uh, I if there is an empty space on the board somewhere where I can um, win on the next turn, I should probably um, 
I should probably put my circle there, right? So read some comments here. I know I missed a few. It's true, though, that if you can get away with implementing an equivalent iterative solution, it will typically be at least as efficient as its recursive counterpart. But it's true that Bavik said some solutions are just much cleaner when using recursion. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, like navigating trees and stuff like that. Irene, if you mean a game to allow the player to solve the Rubik's Cube, it probably wouldn't be too complicated. Deciding how to handle the input is probably the biggest problem there. If you mean a Rubik's Cube solver, probably would be a challenge. Not a solver, just player to play the game. That would be, I missed where, he, where Bavik suggested that. Um, Oh, he says there, I have an idea for a game in 3D, Unity, a game to solve a Rubik's Cube. Total 3D game would be hard to implement. Um, would it be hard to implement? Mm, I'd have to think about it. It wouldn't be super easy, but I don't think it would be impossible. Um, OK. A sliding puzzle with picks. Yeah, like the game of 15, which we've done. That would be easier. Um, it would be a nice homage to, um, to CS50's Game of 15 as well. Pi game. I will try to implement tic-tac-toe with the recursive way, but I'd have to do it in Python. I have a grip on it the most. Any graphical libraries for Python? Yeah, Pi game is, a, is the one that I typically hear about. Logic would be easy. The mechanics, not too difficult, but there's a bunch of different options. It's a fun idea, though. Thanks for the fun stream. I'm headed out. Got to help find a friend with something. It's been fun. Thanks, L. Uh, J. Lardenois. Appreciate you tuning in today on the stream. Another idea for a 2D game. I don't know what game it's called on our Draw 50 Tic-Tac-Toe. I draw a basic structure on the bottom left corner. Uh, oh, OK. Let's pull that up and see what you've drawn. So uh, Tic-Tac-Toe. Bottom left corner. Um, I forget how to pan. Is it sh it's not Shift, right? No, it's Command. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, sorry. Shoot, I mean. Crap. I'm sorry, Bavik. I think I, I think I deleted it on accident. I hit the wrong I hit the wrong key. Uh, sorry about that. If you wouldn't mind redrawing it, I'll keep it up here, um, and I can see what it is. Uh, <laughs> nice little nice little blunder there. Um, basically, a player joins the dots turn by turn. There we go. Getting drawn live on, on, on the stream here. If one player succeeds to create a box, he puts his initials there. Oh, OK. So it's like a, a, convex, a convex space partitioning game. That would be interesting, actually. I'd have to think about how to calculate the um, how to calculate whether a convex space has been generated. But yeah, no, that'd be super cool. And it looks like you can only generate segment, uh, vertical and horizontal segments. It looks like. Yeah, good. That's a cool idea. Dots and boxes, says JP guy. Uh, Asley says, what about Tetris? Yeah, we could look at Tetris because I actually implemented a version of Tetris for the games course that we didn't end up using for a project. So we could resurrect that. That'd be cool, one of these streams. I'm also thinking about doing a Pac-Man stream. Um, I made Minesweeper with React. It was a blast, says Sheen Katz. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting, actually. Brian did a React stream, and he did a, a that basic flashcards game, but a, something like Minesweeper or uh, I think somebody recommended the typing game. That would be pretty cool, like a typing test type game or a typing, some version of a typing challenge game. Yeah, the, uh, that dots and boxes idea is pretty cool. We'd have to, we'd potentially be able to take a look at that. Um, cool, cool. All right, so good idea. Thanks for the idea. We'll keep the ideas coming. We uh, have lots of time to do lots of different cool stuff. So the AI has taken its turn. The AI is not a smart AI at all. So what we need to do is figure out how we can get the AI to look at any potential openings in the board. So sort of to predict where, not predict where the player is going, I guess effectively to predict where the player is going to uh, take their turn. 
And so a way to do it would be to probably see if there's any horizontal, vertical, or diagonal match that has um, a single spot in it. And the AI can then fill that spot preemptively to prevent um, the player from closing it. And so what the player could do is, did, uh, or what the AI can do is just do the same kind of iteration that we did before and then just get however many tiles are um, open or filled in that row. If it's equal to one, one tile open, get the tile and then put the circle there, right? So it would kind of be a reuse of the uh, code that we had before, the check verticals, check horizontals. So you could say, um, this part would be like the random part. So we basically say, else. And then uh, we'd have this while, this whole while loop sort of nested. So what we want to do is say, um, gap found is equal to false. And then we say, um, or rather, I guess we would have some block of code to check if we found a gap. And then set whether we found the gap to uh, again. And then we say uh, if gap found. Rather, what we should do is just say if not gap found, then. And then. We do the random generation. We choose a tile to place our circle in randomly, right? So then the, the block of code that's important becomes checking row by row, column by column, diagonal, both diagonals, um, and seeing if there's a one, a single opening in that row. Uh, we can fill a spot with the opposite symbol, call check victory, and then reset the values of winning player. This is Major Drafat. Yeah, I guess we could do something like that, right? And game over. We can fill a spot with the opposite symbol. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. OK. So we would say something like, uh, we would try this for every column and every row and every diagonal. So we would say something like, um, for, let's do, let's do, um, Let's do. Let's check the uh, dia let's check the horizontals first, just like we did before. Check verticals, just like we did before, and then check the diagonals, just like we did before. So for the horizontals, if we say four, um, and this is every row, so we say four y is equal to one until grid height do, and then for this would be four x is equal to one grid width do. Um, we want to basically, per what Mage Drafat's recommendation is, we can put a x in that spot. Um, well, for in any given spot, if it's equal to the empty string. So we'll say if um, say if grid y x is equal to, oh, well, I guess this should be um, for x is equal to 1. Uh, this is for every row, right? So this will be for y is equal to, 
and then for x is equal to 1 or 3, 2. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. I guess we could check vertical. No, we don't even need I don't think we even need any of this stuff. I think we can just say f for every single thing in our grid, we'll just say um, if grid y x is equal to um, the empty string, um, we'll say grid y x is equal to x, right? And then we'll say uh, if check victory, then Uh, if check victory, then we want to actually set grid yx equal to uh, circle. And then we want to say um, game over is equal to false, because our check victory actually sets game over to false, and winning player equal to, uh, in that case, it would set it to 1. So we're going to set it to 0. And then we're going to set gap found equal to true, right? And then we can, uh, well, in this case, if there are multiple spots, it'll place it in there. So what we need to do is we need to actually return at this point. So let's return. OK, perfect. So we'll go through the whole grid, uh, rows and columns. And this, because we've already written the check victory function, this will go. This will take care of all horizontals, all verticals, and all diagonal possible victories on the x. And what this just does preemptively is um, fills it with circle if it detects that there's a victory, and then returns immediately. Cool. And then if we haven't returned after we've gone through the whole entire grid, if we haven't found a single match. Um, then gap found will be, I guess gap, it doesn't matter whether gap found is set to true or not, right? Uh, we actually, yeah, we don't even need the, we don't need to test for gap found. We'll just have the while statement with the while loop in there, right? Um, and then current player, make, we do have to set current player equal to one. And that should be it. Let's run it. So I'm going to, um, whoops. Oh, it looks like I, uh, I screwed something up in my logic. OK, that's fine. So I got a force quit tic-tac-toe. I have an infinite loop in there somewhere. Let's figure out where, let's figure out where I put an infinite loop. Um, OK, if check victory. Oh, because took turn does took turn never get set to true? Took turn does get set to true here. And we are setting took turn is false, gap found is false. We are returning, right? And then check victory does return. Oh, does check victory not return true? I guess check victory doesn't return true. So we're not actually ever um, testing for that. So what we just need to do then is just say um, if check victory and or rather what we should do is say uh, check victory if and then we can say if uh, game over then and that should work. I, I I think I might still have an issue in there somewhere. Oh, it, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. It took two turns. 
Okay. We have a little bit of a <laughs> we have a little bit of an issue here. Uh, yeah, it does not return true. Check victory does set the um, it does set the flag for game over though. If there's a if there is a game over. Oh. I see. OK, so I had I wasn't clearing the tiles that we wrote um, that we wrote an X into, so I fixed that. So I because we were basically iterating over every single one, writing an X in there and then checking to see if there was a victory. Um, and then if there was a victory, then it would uh, it would write the zero or the O in there. But if there was not a victory, then it would keep the X. And therefore, it would look like it, like it looked like it was taking multiple turns. Uh, so we want to not have that happen. So if I do this, boom, it's actually pretty good, right? Um, but I can still win. So I did. That's a pretty, it's a pretty decent AI, right? There, I, there's more, you can get more complicated with it. Um, you can do like, pre I think whoever takes the first turn in tic-tac-toe has some sort of um, like deterministically uh, winning moves they can do. I forget offhand. It's been a while. Uh, I'm going to commit that. So let's say get status. Um, and we'll say added um, simple AI. Let's see if I can actually get the AI to win. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. So if I do something like that, oh whoops, uh, like that. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, it had to, it had to choose. I put the AI in a tough position. I think that's what it is. I think it's that, then that, then that. I think that'll always screw over the opponent. Um, so if I do something like that, nice. Player two one in that case. Um, cool. So it's it's not a hard opponent to beat. But it, it, it's an AI. It exists. It works. We can get fancier with it, but it might take, that might take a little bit more time. Um, I think that that'll wrap up probably what we talk about today. We have a pretty simple tic-tac-toe implementation. Um, we went through you know, how to calculate victories, horizontal, vertical, diagonals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we got to even reuse our check victory function to do the AI placement in advance. So shout outs to Major Fat for the um, for the suggestion there, that was uh, that was an excellent way to do it. And Irene is saying as much in the chat. Uh, it was a nice way to solve it. I did a tic-tac-toe a few years back for free code camp, and I can't even understand what I did to solve the AI part. AI50 says JP with the kappa. Yeah, very very next level AI. You know, the, watch out, the machines are going to take over soon. Um, but yeah, I'll stick around for a few questions, a couple minutes as always, and um, we'll wrap up tic-tac-toe. Slightly shorter stream. It's a very simple game that we did today. Um, and I'll, I'll consider what might be some good games to, to dive into next. I know that I do want to do more Unity stuff. I know that I do want to do something like Space Invaders and uh, Pac-Man in the future, so some arcade classics. Um, I do know that there are some other suggestions that people have, like the Rubik's Cube and the, uh, the uh, boxes and initials uh, idea that uh, Bavik Knight suggested there in the chat. Uh, Karal Sai says, when is the next game dev stream? I am not sure, actually. So t on Friday, we have Nick Wong, who's doing a Linux command tutorial. We have, um, and that'll be at 3.30 on Friday. And the next Monday, we have Veronica Nutting, who's CS50's uh, head CA, who's going to be doing a um, 100 cool things you can do in Python. I say 100 with an asterisk because I don't know if we're actually going to have time to go through all 100 things. But maybe we can get through a, a large chunk of it or possibly do two parts to the stream. 
Next Tuesday, we'll have David J. Malin himself will give us a regex stream. So that'll be really cool. So regular expressions. So basically how to take text and figure out if it matches a particular pattern. Super useful. Used to um, verify emails, passwords, uh, and all sorts of things, phone numbers, you name it. You can train it to recognize pretty much any pattern you want. And then on a Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday is going to be a super special secret stream that we're not going to reveal the details on just yet. But stay tuned for that one. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll be next Wednesday. Um, and then next Thursday and Friday is Thanksgiving and Black Friday, so we're not going to have any streams then. Then the week after that, I think, is when I'll probably schedule the next game stream. And uh, the details will be up on f our Facebook at some point whenever, that, um, whenever we figure that out. I'm leaning towards maybe Space Invaders or something like that. Um, but we'll see. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have to give it some thought. Bevic Knight says, Regex, that's going to be great. Yep, now I'm excited for it. It's going to be awesome. Bella Kirsten, it's been fun. Thank you, Colton, for the stream. Yep, no problem. Thanks for joining. Major Jafat, uh, I want to thank you for the help you do in the Facebook group. I have learned a lot from your helpful comments saying about Irene. Uh, yes, she's very helpful in the Facebook group. Could I say, oh, that's a lot of time. Yeah, it's going to be a while. Um, but in the weeks to come, hopefully, uh, you know, once or twice a week, we'll see. We've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of people that have a lot of awesome stream ideas, which is super great. And then as it says, Space Invaders would be nice. Yeah, that would be, that'd be fun. And we implemented that for the games course for the first project. So we have all the code available for that already. But we would probably do a from scratch dive into it as well. Because um, that's fun. I haven't implemented Pac-Man from scratch before, so that would be fun. Um, but again, I, I do want to get into more Unity stuff even just for myself, um, but also just because people really like Unity and it's useful and 3D is cool and fun. So if you have any more ideas for that, definitely let us know. And if you have ideas for any stream beyond the stuff that you've seen us dive into so far, uh, let me know. Write to us on Facebook. And if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, follow us on twitch.tv slash c50tv. It's there on the screen. I'm going to switch over to the larger view. It uh, says, yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of choosing which one to turn and the visuals, but yes, that would work. Um, thank you, glad to have helped. Yeah, yeah, the Rubik's Cube idea would be pretty, um, it'd be pretty involved, but that'd be cool. Unity, excuse me, Unity 2D says, uh, Nuwanda, excuse me, Asley, yeah. I, I do want to go into some Unity 2D stuff as well. What would the Facebook group be? I'd love to check out the community. Um, so group, I think I believe it's facebook.com slash groups slash CS50. Yep, uh, facebook.com, I'll write it in the chat. And then our actual Facebook page is facebook.com slash CS50. So two different pages. The latter is where we post events and things like that. And then the former is where our actual group is, where our community gets together to solve problems, talk to each other. Irene has a great presence in there. Andre has an, uh, a great presence in there as well. Two people that have been in the chat today. Um, and you'll see every event, every stream going forward, you'll see it posted there. So definitely, if you're watching this, either on Twitch or on YouTube, go ahead and click those links, follow us on Facebook. Add us on Facebook, join the group. Uh, makes sense, I only followed the second page, says the JP guy. Yeah, the, uh, the second page is a, our my public page where we post a lot of stuff, but it's not as conversational. The Facebook group is a community-oriented page. Um, great, strong community. And you'll see all the updates and everything that we do. Um, you'll see them in both, but the, the, the Facebook group is where more discussion takes place. Today's stream was pretty easy. It was not bad. It was fun. Not as many hiccups as we've had in the past, I will say. The uh, checking matches code is a little large, but we factor, you know, we split it up. So it's not terrible, but certainly with some more engineering forethought, we could make something probably a bit more elegant. But you know, we do it, we're doing it live, we're doing it on stream. It's not going to be perfect. But we had a good time. Uh, 
Uh, I'll stick around for just a couple more questions, if anybody has any, um, and then we'll depart. And uh, tomorrow we will not have a stream, but on Friday, again, Nick Wong. Linux commands, if you're uncomfortable at the command line and want a tutorial on things like LS and CD, what is a shell? What are some of the things that you can do in a shell? Um, some of the things that are for beginners, some of the more advanced stuff. I think he's going to cover quite a large range of material. Um, uh, Karal says, have you published any games? Nope, uh, but it's something that I would like to do in the future. I plan on trying to, at some point, just have to write, the, write a good game. It was great, lots of fun today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Irene, for coming in as always. Always have a nice, strong presence in the, uh, in the Twitch chat. We appreciate it. And on the Facebook. Looking forward for the next stream on Linux command line, says Sasha Khan. Me too, me too. Which shell are we going to talk about, says Bavik Knight? Uh, Bash on, on Mac, but a lot of the principles will apply to pretty much any shell that you use, um, like ZSH and other shells. Probably not as much like Windows PowerShell and the uh, Windows command prompt, but it will be kind of similar, sort of in that ballpark. Sashka says, thanks, Colton. It's amazing. No, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Shout out to Dan Coffey, everybody. He's here in the studio. Just popped in. Want to make a cameo appearance? No? Yeah, it was really fun today. And so, you know, I only knew how to do something like that because they took your course and we did a similar thing, but I can't remember which game. Uh, Probably the match three game, Mage, I'm guessing. No Windows shells, Unix shells for the win. Thanks, Colton. Fun as always, says Andre. Thanks, Andre. Appreciate it. If you publish the game, you definitely have players from this Twitch chat, says Ashley. Yeah, uh, that would be very gracious of you. Thank you. One day. We'll see. All right, uh, I'm probably going to call it here for today. So this is CS50 on Twitch. Um, thank you so much for coming to today's tic-tac-toe implementation. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all on Friday with Nick Wong and uh, for the future game stream. Details of that will be published on Facebook, as always. Tune in also next week with Veronica on Python and David on Regular Expressions and on Wednesday for our super secret uh, super secret awesome stream that we're going to be having with which no details have been published about. Uh, so anyway, thank you all so much everybody. I will see you next time. Have a good one.